Okay, and we are live on YouTube. Okay, Rich, you want to go ahead? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the January 19th, 2021 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Here. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum? Here. Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Lutfi? And Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. Okay, we're all set. Great, thank you. And welcome to the January 19th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This meeting is being held via Zoom and um, also live streamed on YouTube. So if you would like to watch the proceedings today, you may do so by going to our YouTube channel and watching it there on the live stream. And if you would like to participate in any of the public hearing items, please join the Zoom meeting at the estimated time listed on our uh, public hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. And the Zoom information can be found on our website. At the beginning of the testimony portion of each item, we will also display the Zoom meeting information so you can join. And we will be starting this morning with a public meeting for design proposed designation items and then moving into our Preservation Department public meeting and public hearing agenda. And commissioners, I am so pleased and excited today that we're going to be kicking off the new year with three items to be considered for calendaring. These items are the first of several proposals that we've been working on during this past year. And before we get to them, I want to provide some context for these proposals. Our executive director, Lisa Kersavage, will begin the meeting by sharing LPC's equity framework. And this is a framework that is intended to guide our priorities agency-wide this year. And she will also explain how the items that we're proposing for calendaring today fit into that framework. And I know this is unusual for us to make such a presentation, but these are challenging times. This last year has been one of the most challenging our nation has faced with attacks on democracy, the pandemic, with the loss of life, damage to the economy, and how it exposed systemic failures, as well as the killing of George Floyd, Ahmed Arbor, and Breonna Taylor, and the despair and anger expressed subsequently. So I believe that these events have made it important for us to publicly reaffirm our commitment to equity in all aspects of our work. And we've spent the last several months about a framework that ensures our commitment and that will formally lay the groundwork for our work this year and into the future. So the policy goals of equity have been a touchstone of Mayor de Blasio's administration and addressing equity in every aspect of LPC's work has been my priority throughout my tenure. And this includes enhancing transparency and accessibility in our regulatory work and prioritizing designations that represent New York City's diversity and designations in areas less represented by landmarks. And our recent designations reflect that prioritization. So with this background, we will only, uh, we will today share work that we have done and um, we will explain our framework and explain um, how the work that we'll be doing in the coming months will fit into that framework. And so with that, I will turn it over to Lisa to begin the presentation. Great, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, commissioners. So to accomplish Chair Carroll's prioritization of equity and inclusion in our work, the agency is seeking to ensure diversity and inclusion in our designations, to make sure that we're telling the story of all New Yorkers, to ensure effective outreach, both for our regulatory work and in garnering support for designation, which requires the agency to acknowledge and work with the incredible diversity amongst New Yorkers in terms of language and culture. And to ensure fairness, transparency, and efficiency in regulations, making sure that all pr property owners understand the agency's processes and have equal access to resources. This ensures that proposed work is approved in a timely manner and that we are supporting property owners through technical assistance and improved guidance. With these goals in mind, or with these equity goals in mind, 
specific plans for this year include um, for our regulatory work. Um, first, I'm really thrilled to announce that LPC will soon be launching a major initiative to develop robust e-filing process, which will make filing, managing, and tracking applications easier for all, particularly homeowners who file their own applications. Secondly, we are also focusing on increased outreach to homeowners on how to work with LPC and ensure access, fairness, and transparency. In our administration department, while we don't have a large capital budget, we have sought to improve our MWBE per performance. And while we are proud that we are, have among the highest grades in the city from the controller, we want to improve our performance with African-American owned businesses. Likewise for grants, which is an area of capital spending, um, we plan to do an enhanced outreach to contractors to improve our performance with African-American contractors in particular. Our archaeology department will continue efforts to share stories learned from archaeological artifacts, which reveal information about everyday New Yorkers and more accurately reflect New York City's economic and social diversity throughout history. The remainder of this presentation will be related to the work of the research department. Historic buildings embody the stories and experiences of people and thoughtful exploration of historical context and designations can expand public recognition and equitable representation of New York City's diverse history. Under Chair Carroll, we've been setting the commission's designations to date and developing a set of priorities to ensure more equitable representation of New York's diverse history through our designations. In particular, we are focusing on communities whose stories and experiences have not yet been adequately told. As we strive for full inclusion, I also want to put in context designations we've done in this administration, which provides a context for how we have been approaching designations and how we will continue to. Since LPC's earliest years, the agency has been designating places of cultural and historic significance, and the Commission has for five decades been recognizing places related to African American history in particular. For example, the houses on Hunter Fly Road, also known as Weeksville, was designated in 1970 as the only surviving group of houses from an early 19th century free black community. In recent years, we've continued to advance historic district and individual landmark designations related to New York City's long and varied African-American history. Examples include Mount Morris Park Historic District Extension in Harlem, home to one of New York City's most vibrant African-American communities that became home to many prominent African-Americans in the 1920s. The Central Harlem West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District illustrates not only the architectural development of Harlem, but the rich social, cultural, and political life of Harlem's African-American population in the 20th century, and includes the national headquarters of the March on Washington, a property strongly associated with Bayard Rustin and James Baldwin's house, which is the most significant surviving building in the United States associated with the celebrated novelist, essayist, poet, and civil rights advocate. We have prioritized designations that reflect and foster our incredible diversity, which we believe is New York City's greatest strength. And these designations themselves are diverse. Stonewall Inn was the starting point of the Stonewall Rebellion, one of the most important sites associated with LGBTQ history in New York City and the nation. The Staten Island home of the critically acclaimed African-American novelist, poet, essayist, and feminist, Audre Lorde. The Coney Island's boardwalk has given people of all economic and social backgrounds free access to the beach and seaside since 1923 and is the embodiment of Coney Island's democratic spirit. Chair Carroll is also focused on ensuring geographic diversity, and the agency has designated many firsts in their respective neighborhoods. Examples include four historic districts in Sunset Park, a historic district in Inwood, the Manita Street Historic District in Hunts Point, Bronx, and recently the East 25th Street Historic District in East Flatbush. And this picture shows a community celebration on the day of designation um, when our, one of our staff members happened to be there. What we learned in these designations is that in many places, historic architecture drew people together and their community spirit grew stronger through their collective efforts to preserve it. In recent designation reports, LPC has been clear in documenting that throughout American history, there have been policies and actions at every level of government 
that have furthered inequities and have been racist. In recent designations, such as Monida Street in the South Bronx and P- uh, Public School 48 in South Jamaica, Queens, the designation reports describe the history of redlining and disinvestment in the neighborhoods as part of the na- narrative. And in the designation of the row um, of five buildings that best represent Tin Pan Alley, we recognize the significant contributions and achievements of African Americans in music publishing at Tin Pan Alley. And we also acknowledge that the Jim Crow laws and other unjust discriminatory practices and entrenched systemic racism that led to the racist characters and stereotypes of African Americans in the sheet music produced at Tin Pan Alley. We will continue to address these issues. LPC's research department is committed to the highest standards of historical scholarship and archival research and to bringing complex issues to light. Their work has been aided by access to new research sources and increasing scholarship related to social justice. Many recent initiatives, such as the LGBT initiative, are the result of research department studies and years of survey and research. In addition, in districts such as Central Harlem, it took deliberate and intensive research to uncover the previously untold story of how Harlem Harlem residents adapted many of the residential buildings to accommodate a variety of cultural, religious, civic, and political uses, particularly during the Harlem Renaissance and through the 1960s, and how these institutions sustained the community and fostered social justice over decades. Finally, doing research through an equity lens can require the the need for new tools, such as oral histories. The research department has incorporated community interviews and oral histories into recent work at Tin Pan Alley, Manita Street, and East 25th Street, and plans to do so similarly with some future, uh, with some pending designations. While our designation reports are first and foremost regulatory documents outlining significance and guidance for regulation, they also expand our understanding of history. They have incorporated deeper investigations into historical context over the years. However, because they are regulatory documents, they aren't always very accessible to the public, and they don't necessarily connect stories between designations across boroughs or decades when they were designated. To better make these connections, LPC has produced a number of story maps that are highly visual and condensed stories around themes. For example, New York City and the Path to Freedom documents designated buildings associated with the multiple ways people and institutions engage with the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. Doing additional research on the interconnectedness of New York City's landmarks and districts allows a fuller story and makes our city's diverse history more accessible. Through doing additional research on such sites, we have found that New York City, and Brooklyn in particular, may have one of the largest concentrations of designated sites related to abolitionists history and the Underground Railroad in the country. In summary, this year and beyond, in our research and designations, we will seek to prioritize designations that reflect the city's diversity and in areas less represented by landmarks, address difficult and contested histories, and emphasize the fight for social justice and civil rights, undertake inclusive research, and seek to tell the story of all New Yorkers. The three items being considered today are in keeping with those priorities. Conference House Park archeological site addresses a gap in designations. It would be the first, uh, excuse me, it would be the city's first landmark recognizing the many generations of Native Americans who lived in the area. In addition, research staff has already started to work with the city's federally and state of recognized tribes to ensure inclusive research. Holyrood Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, adds representation of New York City's Latino community. Finally, the education building is significant as the former home of the National Office of the NAACP in the early 20th century, as well as many progressive organizations that advance social justice and equality. You will hear more about all of those from Kate. And finally, on February 2nd, we plan to bring forward the proposed Dorrance Brooks Historic District in Harlem to be considered for calendaring. We have been working with the local community for some time and are excited to be advancing it. The proposed district has highly intact streetscapes of late 19th century and early 20th century architecture and rich associations with the Harlem Renaissance and civil rights movement. As we are approaching the 100th anniversary, 100 year anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance, it is particularly 
important and appropriate time to recognize it and celebrate the significant cultural and social history of the neighborhood. The district would be anchored by Dorrance Brook Square, which was named after the um, black serviceman who died in action while serving with the segregated military regiment in the First World War. If designated, this would be the city's first historic district named for an African American. Commissioners, thank you for your indulgence in letting us share a commitment to furthering equity in, and inclusion in the work we do. Thank you so much, Lisa. And we'll now turn it over to Kate Lemos McHale, our Director of Research, to take us through the items we're proposing for calendaring today. And if there are any questions for me or Lisa or Kate, we're happy to answer those questions um, at any time. Um, but if there aren't any questions now, we'll jump right to the uh, research agenda. All right, Kate, take it away. Thank you, Sarah and Lisa. Uh, item number one this morning is LP 2648, Conference House Park Archaeological Site at 298 Satterley Street, Staten Island, Block 7857, Lot 1 in part. The item proposed for the Commission's calendar is an approximately 20-acre site within Conference House Park that is associated with over 8,000 years of occupation by Native American people and contains important archeological resources. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research. Uh, the proposed landmark, which at this time has a generic name of Conference House Park Archeological Site is located in Tottenville at the southernmost point of Staten Island. The site is associated with over 8,000 years of occupation by Native American people. It contains the region's largest known prehistoric burial ground <clears throat> and is the best preserved known archaeological site associated with Native American occupation in New York City. It is proposed, as Lisa said, as the city's first landmark specifically recognizing the many generations of Native Americans who lived in the area. Designation would protect the site's below ground archaeological resources. Shown here in red, the proposed landmark site includes approximately 20 acres of highly archaeologically sensitive land located within the city's Conference House Park. There are two designated New York City landmarks located directly north of the proposed landmark site, Conference House, which gives the park its name, and the Henry Hogg Biddle House. Native Americans have lived in what is now New York City, including Conference House Park, for thousands of years, as indicated on this timeline. One of the earliest sites discovered on the East Coast was in Staten Island, about three miles to the north of the proposed site. There, artifacts were found dating to about 14,000 years ago. In this earliest period, the geography and ecology of the area were very different. People only stayed in places for brief periods of time as they focused on hunting big game like Mastodon. Over the next millennia, the area evolved and became a place with abundant and varied resources, including nut bearing trees, fish and shellfish like oysters, and smaller game like deer and turkeys. People began to stay in places for longer. And in the woodland period, beginning about 1500 years ago, Villages were built as local resources were utilized to support more people for longer lengths of time. Archaeology can and has shed light on what life was like for the people who lived in this area over this long period of time. The proposed landmark site was visited and utilized for thousands of years. In the woodland period, a village and burial ground were at this site. They were likely Lenape, but we do not know the name of the village or how many generations of people lived here. They certainly relied upon the area's abundant resources, including ample oysters, fish, and game. This Dutch map from 1639 shows the locations of some Native American villages at that time. None are shown on Staten Island, but this is likely a reflection of the ignorance of the mapmaker. 
Archaeology has provided information about the proposed landmark site's long occupation. At least 16 archaeological projects have occurred in the vicinity of the proposed landmark since the 19th century, including work by the American Museum of Natural History in the late 19th century and John Milner and Associates in 2003 to 4, which found the projectile points used for hunting and the cer ceramic shard de depicted here. These projects uncovered an important burial ground that included over 70 burials. In addition, 127 archaeological features primarily associated with the Woodland era village were uncovered. The archaeologists also uncovered a series of hearths and other artifacts from the early archaic period about 8,000 years ago, confirming that cooking, butchering, and tool making were among the activities that occurred at the site. The site still contains archaeological resources, including the shell midden shown here on the right and highlighted in red. Um, shell middens are collections of discarded shells, usually oyster, that sometimes include other types of food waste, tools, and on occasion culturally sensitive materials, and provide further indication of the long use of the site by Native Americans. An example of an exposed midden not located at Camp Conference House Park is shown on the left for reference. The British enacted a series of land deeds circa 1670 that took Staten Island from Native Americans who were likely Lenape, but we do not know when the last Native Americans left this site. Soon after, Christopher Billup received a land patent from the Crown for more than a thousand acres. His property included the proposed landmark site, as well as the land to the north on which he built Conference House circa 1675. It's named that now uh, for an unsuccessful peace conference held there during uh, the Revolutionary War. The Henry Hogg Biddle House built around the 1840s by a wealthy real estate developer is located just north of Conference House. And photos of these two designated landmarks are shown on the left. After Samuel Ward purchased nearly 400 acres of land in the area, it became known as Ward's Point. And although it was surveyed and laid out in the 1870s, it remained largely undeveloped as is evident in this 1907 Robinson map. The proposed landmark contains significant archeological resources, including evidence from the period of contact between Native Americans and European colonists, as well as from the colonial period and 19th century. For example, projectile points made of copper and brass like the one shown here have been found at the site. These metals became available once Europeans began to trade with Native Americans. And so finding evidence of these is considered a key indicator that the site was used during the contact period. The map on the left is a Dutch depiction of their encounter with Native Americans drawn in 1651. In 1926, Conference House Park was donated to the city of New York and today it remains under the ownership of the Department of Parks and Recreation. The modern park includes paths like the ones shown here on the right, hiking and biking trails and a visitor center housed within the one-story 1920s bungalow shown on the left. Undisturbed woodlands and beach comprise the remainder of the site, which also includes a distinctive ridge where many of the documented burials were found. The proposed landmark would be New York City's first to formally and specifically acknowledge and recognize the thousands of years of Native American occupation and settlement in the area. As a New York City park, the site has long been protected and cared for by the city's Department of Parks and Recreation. The proposed designation, which will focus on the site's below ground resources, would formalize our current interagency coordination. LPC review would be required for all projects within the proposed landmark uh, site with the potential to impact archaeological resources, ensuring the maximum level of protection. Currently, only projects subject to federal and state regulation require such a review. Uh, commissioners, we would like to note that as part of the proposed designation, we'll be considering site-specific resiliency issues related to rising sea levels at this coastal shoreline site. In years past, LPC has designated other archeological resources, including the African burial ground and Commons historic district shown here, 
We have also designated numerous cemeteries and burial grounds where we regulate proposed in-ground work, such as new utility lines. Uh, and I'd just like to note that the proposed landmark site very closely corresponds um, with the boundaries of a national historic landmark, the Wards Point Archaeological Site, which is shown here, it was established in 1993 um, to preserve its archaeological resources. The area is also listed in the National Register of Historic Places as the Wards Point Conservation Area, which encompasses the proposed landmark site. LPC research on the site is ongoing and will include robust engagement with the city's federally and state recognized tribes. Staff has already met with representatives um, of four of the five recognized tribes, and we look forward to closely working with them as we research the history and significance of the site and try to better understand the people and the places associated with it. Um, in addition, input from the tribes will help inform the official landmark name, we hope, uh, which we plan to change to better reflect its Native American significance. Uh, designation of the Conference House Park archaeological site would protect and preserve the largest and best documented known site associated with thousands of years of Native American habitation in New York City. The research and archaeology staff, and it's been great to work with Amanda Sutphin on this, um, recommend that the commission calendar the proposed Conference House Park archaeological site for consideration as a New York City landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I see we have our, a question. Commissioner Gustafson, please go ahead. Um, how did this site withstand um, uh, Superstorm Sandy? This is a good question. I, I don't know exactly. Um, there are a lot of um, work to hold the dunes up. Um, and so that is, you can still see that um, on site, but I don't know if Lisa, you. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Commissioner. I think, um, I'm not sure that this was damaged as much as other shorelines in Staten Island. I know that the, um, the, resiliency work that's being done um, by the Army Corps of Engineers is, is not quite here. It's um, a little bit around closer to Prince's Bay. Um, so I'm not sure that this was hit quite as bad as other parts of Staten Island, but it is an area of concern. Um, you know, when we've been walking the site, you can see um, mm -hmm. some of the erosion um, already taking place. We know that it's something Parks is working on, but I think it's an area um, for more exploration for us, especially as we consider um, resiliency initiatives um, for the designation report. Yeah, I, I think the area had suffered before Sandy, it had been suffering um, erosion, um, you know, from the, um, I guess it's uh, just south of the Conference House Park, um, what used to be the roadbed of Highland Boulevard and across. Um, the Conference House itself survived fine because it's sitting very high up on a knoll, as you know. Um, but that area, uh, the designation site is, um, is a little bit lower, lower lands, but I don't know how close to sea level it is. Um, I have a second question and that's, um, um, how will the designation change um, uh, the day-to-day -day use of the site as parkland? Uh, I really, it will not. I think it's, it's, it recognizes the very, very important history that's on the site and any proposed work that may impact below ground resources, we would um, review very carefully. Uh, to, to our knowledge, what is uh, the park's uh, position on this uh, designation? Very supportive and cooperative. We've been working with them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. You may have said this. Um, so will this be a scenic landmark or is it a, another designation called an archeological landmark? It's, an it's proposed as an individual landmark. Um, yeah. Thank you. Right, and, and because the scenic landmark is really significant for its landscape or landscape design, um, and 
and so it the, the definition isn't necessarily applicable to the resources that we are identifying and protecting here um, per se. And so individual landmark is was really the better definition. So individual landmark is what um, the, some of the other burial grounds are. Uh, that's their status as well. Right. The the African burial ground is actually a historic district. Sorry, it's a historic district. Um, because it encompasses a larger area with many lots. So different owners have to apply for below grade work under their buildings even. And, um, but the, some of the other cemeteries are individual landmarks. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, thank you. Um, what, if the site is protected already by um, um, federal government, what Practically, are we adding in terms of protection? How are we enhancing the state, the protect, the preservation of the site regulatorily? Um, we, it really formalizes um, that review for us at the city level. Currently, um, only state and federally funded projects um, would trigger our formal review. Um, although we do collaborate and, and provide guidance. Um, but so this at the city level would really make that um, formal review part of the process. And, and if I can just, if I can just jump in, the, yeah. you know, so, so even under the federal and state actions, we're just, we're, we're involved uh, as an expert agency in the environmental review um, side of things. It's not a regulatory, a pure regulatory uh, involvement. And right now we work with the Parks Department on an informal basis, and we all agree that for the long-term protection of the, of the area that we, we should formalize this so that we have actual formal regulatory authority um, in this area. And, you know. But just so I understand that, if under the current regime, if um, a project is being done by the federal or state forces with using federal or state monies, it would be reviewed. But now if, this, if the city were to do something, it would not be reviewed by the state or federal. But now that we're gonna be involved, we, are, we will review that as well. I'm just trying to understand what we're adding in terms of the yeah. protection. Right, so, that's, that, so that is true. So right now as a National Historic Landmark and National Register, it's only a federal or state money is involved in the work and that triggers the environmental review. We have an advisory process in that. And if, um, but currently what happens the Parks Department takes such good care of recognizing the significance of this site. We have an informal relationship with the Parks Department where they are very sensitive and if they do want to do work, they voluntarily consult with our Director of Archaeology, Amanda Sutphin. But the, our designation would actually formalize that forever. And so the city would be bound to uh, work with us and get reports in, uh, in order to do the work. And then we would establish protocols for any um, artifacts discovered during work. So it's, it's plugging a hole in the regulatory protection net. Good, thank yes. you. Yes. Okay, Commissioner uh, Chen, sorry. Yeah, just want to take this uh, moment to uh, commend the LPC and the entire team for including this very, very important site. Uh, uh, I'm I couldn't say more than, you know, just for the thousands of years that the Native Americans that have been here. Uh, and just to follow up on Commissioner Gustafsson and Goldblum's uh, question relating to coastal resiliency. So um, what happened if they need to build, I, we know that Superstorm Sandy affected mostly the Eastern shore of Staten Island for this more toward the Southern shore. But if it's outside in the coastal water and they need to build the additional barrier to prevent or buffer the rising tide, uh, does that fall into our jurisdiction or would that complicate the matter? And by part B of the question is, I know the African burial historic ground also contains the collect pond where the native Indian, the Nanapis called it the place where the sun was born, meaning that that's the Croton Reservoir for Manhattan. And so I wonder whether any archeological uh, find and whether we plan to extend uh, even though currently it's called the African burial, but actually in reality covers the collect pond, which is the original source of drinking water for my understanding for even longer period 
uh, than this one, I think. So those are my questions. I think to the first one, the landmark site follows the current shoreline. So any work that would be done beyond that, it would be outside and so wouldn't be under our jurisdiction. Um, but you know, we understand that there may need to be work done to address resiliency and, and we would work with parks carefully and, and through our review of any potential impact to archeological resources. Um, and Kate, could I just add to that point? Yes. I think that if, if any such work were to be done, it would very likely be done um, with state and federal funding. Um, and again, that would likely trigger environment review because it would be looking at a larger boundary and then we would be involved. And this would be recognized both, you know, as a national historic landmark, but also as a local landmark, which can be helpful in that kind of review. Um, then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Kate. <laughs> um, I, I think that the collect pond question is very interesting, Commissioner Chen, and I, you know, I, I want to maybe think more about that. But um, it's very important site. Uh, yeah, as well. yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, because if you look at the medallions on the ground throughout Foley Square, um, you know, as well as, um, you know, um, uh, all the uh, surrounding uh, parks, uh, the medallions indicate, uh, you know, the hunting, the gaming, the fishing, as well as the, the, the source of the water. So that is uh, something worth looking into. Great. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Devonshire. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. Uh, two things. Um, in terms of responsibility, if, if, Assuming that LPC staff would be monitoring this area, if we see that it's not being responsibly um, caretaken and there is further erosion, we will have a responsibility to let people know that, that they need to take care of this because there are archaeologically sensitive um, areas within. You mean erosion along the shoreline? Yeah, if, if I think, we, you know, briefly, if Parks isn't doing their job and the place starts to erode, do we have a responsibility then? Do we have, have some sort of power to make sure that, that there are measures taken to uh, remediate and preserve the archaeologically sensitive soils? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a little, there's sort of two, two parts to our responsibility. One is really the, the regular monitoring and preservation of the artifacts in, in place. And, you know, the Parks Department has actually been very, very sensitive about this site. And they have, as I said, sort of talked to us voluntarily and informally in doing any work. And so, yes, we would be have binding authority and we would work them, with them to ensure that any work would not um, do damage or not have a proper protocol in place. In terms of erosion and resiliency, this is something that we need to dig into a little bit more and work with the Parks oh, Department good. on so that we can include that in the designation. So we expect more of that information to unfold as we move through this designation process. So hopefully Great. by the hearing, we'll have more information for you. Great, and could I add one more thing? John sure. Gustafson might enjoy this. I've, I've been reading actually a, a book about the Dutch uh, settlement in New Netherland. And one of the things that I recently <laughs> was reading was they're talking about the West India Company having a difficult time getting people to settle on Staten Island because the Native Americans were such badasses. <laughs> really bizarre. Okay, that, then they built a bridge though. <laughs> Well, it, it's, you know, I think this is one of the interesting things in all of these histories connect and you're, you're learning about them in different ways. And they're all yeah, they, together. I, the, the thing is, they had great oyster beds there and they and they really wanted yeah. to take advantage of that. But everyone was afraid to go out there because the, the Native Americans were, were toughies. Staten Island at its first. <laughs> okay, any other questions? <clears throat> Okay, well, this is, you know, I, I think this is 
so exciting, as I said in the beginning, and I'm really looking forward to moving through this process. So um, if everybody agrees, it would be great to make a motion to calendar and Commissioner Gustafson, would you do the honors and do the motion for us? I move to calendar the Conference House Park archeological site. Okay, and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? I'll be delighted to second it. Great. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that site is calendared. Thank you. We'll move to the next one. Great. Thank you. Item number two is LP 2649, Holyrood Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz at 715 West 179th Street. Manhattan, block 2176, lot 30. Item proposed for the commission's calendar is a Gothic revival style church designed by Bannister and Shell and built in 1911 to 16 that has played an important role in the Latino community of Washington Heights. Holyrood Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, is architecturally significant as a sophisticated and well-executed Gothic revival design by the architectural firm of Bannister and Shell, and culturally significant as an important social and religious anchor for the Washington Heights neighborhood's Latino community for the past 40 years. When built in 1911 to 16, the church's construction reflected the stability and resources of the Washington Heights neighborhood as it transitioned from sparsely settled to a thriving residential area. It has remained an important institution within the neighborhood, its congregation changing to reflect the influx of residents from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and other Spanish speaking nations starting in the 1960s. By 2012, in recognition of its role in this community, the church changed its historic name to add its Spanish translation, becoming Holy Root Church Iglesia Santa Cruz. Recently, it has expanded its outreach by also becoming a center for the hearing impaired with services and programs in American Sign Language. Cited on the corner of West 179th Street and Fort Washington Avenue, the freestanding church is located directly across the street from the George Washington Bridge bus station completed in 1963. The proposed landmark site consists of the lot and the church building. Holyrood, Holyrood Parish was established in 1893 by Reverend William O. Embury, chaplain at a nearby home for girls. Henry C. Potter was the Episcopal Bishop at that time. During his tenure, he encouraged the establishment of additional parishes within the diocese as the population of the city increased. Holyrood was one of the first permanent churches established in Upper Manhattan, and today is the northernmost Episcopal church in the borough with a permanent sanctuary. In 1895, the congregation built its first church, a rambling stone building in a country setting shown here. The fire insurance map on the right shows its location at Broadway and West 181st Street. The map also illustrates how sparsely settled Washington Heights was at that time. Um, in 1911, congregation bought property along Fort Washington Avenue for the site of the present day church indicated by the green triangle on the map. William F. Bannister and Richard M. Shell were the architects of the church. The firm designed a broad range of buildings, including many religious properties in the New York City area. Articles written about the new building reported that its design was inspired by Hereford Cathedral, and indeed the West End is remarkably similar. The first service was held in 1913 in a partially constructed sanctuary that's shown on the map on the right. Holyrood was completed in 1916 and finally dedicated in 1917 becoming one of the most impressive and beautiful churches in the neighborhood. While the new Holyrood Church was being constructed, Washington Heights grew rapidly with the addition of five to six story apartment buildings. New residents were attracted to the area by its um, affordable housing in nearby parks. In addition to its architectural beauty, Holyrood gained a reputation for inclusiveness and furthering humanitarian causes shortly after the church was dedicated. In 1919, the congregation welcomed Gustav Karstensen as their rector. He had previously resigned from his former parish 
because they did not welcome black children from a nearby orphan asylum to the worship services. He was known in his day as very progressive and often came to support causes that were unpopular with fellow clergy in the diocese. As noted in this 1941 article, under his leadership, Holyrood became one of the leading churches in Washington Heights and its ministry and outreach programs continue to champion inclusiveness. During the 1920s and 30s, the neighborhood attracted a large number of Greeks, Irish, and Jews who settled there in increasing numbers, many escaping the political turmoil in Europe. In the 1950s and 60s, the area began to attract a large population of Spanish-speaking people, with many coming from Puerto Rico and Cuba. By the 1980s, Dominicans became the dominant Spanish-speaking cultural group in northern Manhattan. Political changes beginning in the 1960s finally allowed people to leave the Dominican Republic after many years of repression. They settled in Washington Heights, where the cost of housing uh, was more affordable and public transportation provided convenient connections to lower Manhattan. As seen on the left, the Dominican Day Parade began in 1981 in Washington Heights, celebrating their culture and contributions to the city. By 2000, the Latino population represented 75% of the population in Washington Heights and Inwood, with Dominicans making up the majority of these residents. Recently, in 2018, the neighborhood was officially honored as Little Dominican Republic. The ceremony shown above uh, highlighted this commercial and cultural designation. For the past 40 years, Holyrood has continued to serve as an anchor and resource to the residents of the Spanish speaking neighborhood. Recently, the church included Iglesia Santa Cruz as part of its name to express its dual identity. The medieval English word Holyrood and the Spanish Santa Cruz both translate to Holy Cross. In 2012, an article about the parish noted, our me members represent the diversity of the neighborhood, mostly Latino, some West Indians, and some young Anglo professionals. Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz provides facilities for the Dominican Women's Development Center, an independent nonprofit that ad advances gender equality, social justice, education, and similar causes. Even more recently, the parish has become actively involved in an important humanitarian effort with the new sanctuary program, offering a safe haven and help for immigrants in need. In addition to these programs, the parish has recently added programs and services for the hearing impaired, one of only a small handful in the New York diocese. The architecture of the church is a Gothic revival style that was often preferred by the Episcopal Church with its 19th century interest in medieval, English medieval design. The front facing gable terminates a tall nave with buttressed side aisles and, and clear story windows. Tall pinnacles frame the main window and extend far beyond the parapet, dominating the skyline and creating a striking appearance on the hill overlooking the Hudson River. Shown here is the south facing facade that incorporates the parish house and administrative offices visible at the far right. As illustrated in comparison with the tax photo, the church building today looks very much as it did 80 years ago in 1940. Dominating the entrance facade is an impressive tall stained glass window with delicate geometric stone tracery. The filigree-like Gothic details in terracotta at the front facade contrast dramatically with the quarry-faced stone along the side that has a more rugged appearance. The view on the right shows the narrow parking lot to the north of the church building, originally intended to accommodate a small chapel that was never built. Minor alterations include signage, replacement of doors, um, window protectors, and the installation of ramps and railings for universal access to the sanctuary and side entrances. None of these alterations have compromised the building's integrity. Today, Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz is remarkably intact with excellent integrity of design and materials. This outstanding example of a Gothic revival church has served Washington Heights since its construction over 100 years ago and continues to serve the diverse, predominantly Spanish-speaking community, offering services and programs in Spanish as well as English. During the past 40 years, it has expanded its outreach programs and continues its tradition of humanitarian and culturally diverse programs to people of all ages, the LGBTQ community, the hearing impaired, and the homeless and hungry. 
The research department recommends that Holy Rood Episcopal Church Iglesia Santa Cruz be added to the commission's calendar. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Commissioners, are there any questions on this item? Okay, this is, you know, this is another really exciting um, item. We, uh, it's a beautiful church. Um, in some ways, the photographs can't do justice, but you can see the level of details. It's, it's um, really beautiful. And the pastor has been very, uh, working very closely and collaboratively with us. And his message of inclusion, I think, is, is so important um, to his ministry and to um, the community. And I think we'll lay the groundwork for the importance in this designation. Commissioner Gustafson, did you have a question? I did, but you just answered it. I wanted to know whether the uh, congregation and the pastor were supportive. And they are. Thank you. Okay. So, um, all right, with that, so I'd like to move that we um, calendar this item for a future public hearing. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Great. And I'm just, let's unmute everybody for the vote. If so I've sent a request, just hit accept. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, this item is calendared and we'll also hold a hearing on this one in the very near future. And we'll move to the next one. Thank you, Kate. Great, thank you. Item number three is LP 2650, the educational building at 75th Avenue. 75th Avenue, AKA two to six West 13th Street. Manhattan, Block 576, Lot 36. Item proposed for the Commission's calendar is a 12-story Beaux-Arts style loft building built circa 1914 that contained the National Office of the NAACP from 1914 to 1923, as well as many other progressive organizations. The educational building, 75th Avenue, was constructed between 1912 and 1916, commissioned by George Arthur Plimpton, a successful book publisher and philanthropist. This 12-story loft building housed the National Office of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as a remarkable group of progressive tenants that shaped American thought and society, including several that remain active and influential today. On the southwest corner of West 13th Street in Greenwich Village, the educational building, 75th Avenue, occupies an L-shaped lot. The NAACP is one of the oldest and largest civil rights organizations of the United States. Founded in New York City by mostly white reformers in 1909, it sought to fight racism through legal and educational means. The national office was located at 75th Avenue for almost 10 years from February 1914 to July 1923. This was an especially important chapter in the association's early development and history when it launched a series of effective campaigns against segregation, race discrimination and mob violence, particularly the horrendous practice known as lynching, which escalated following the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the mid 1910s. The director of research and publicity, the prominent African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, seen at right in his office at 75th Avenue, was a founder of the organization and editor of its influential journal, The Crisis. Du Bois founded The Crisis in 1910 and was an editor until 1934. This popular and self-supporting magazine, which had a paid circulation of more than 100,000 by 1919 and continues to publish today, contained monthly columns and news reports about NAACP's activities, as well as contributions from noteworthy artists and writers associated with the Harlem Renaissance. In 1920 and 21, Du Bois and Augustus Granville Dill operated an independent publishing company, Du Bois and Dill, which published the Brownies book, the first magazine specifically written for young African-American readers. Du Bois wanted them to be proud of their race and knowledgeable about their history and achievements. Published monthly, the pages were filled with positive imagery and stories by notable black authors. Langston Hughes, for example, made his debut in the Brownies book in 1921. 
In various issues of the magazine, he contributed a poem, play, short story, and nonfiction pieces. One of the most important figures in the New York office was James Weldon Johnson, a former diplomat and skilled tactician. He organized the memorable Silent March down Fifth Avenue in 1917 to protest violence against Blacks in St. Louis, and as field secretary oversaw the establishment of hundreds of new local branches, including many in Southern states. In 1920, he was appointed executive secretary, making him the first African-American to lead the NAACP. Under Johnson, the Dyer Bill to make lynching a federal crime was passed by the US House of Representatives in 1922, but was blocked by a filibuster in the Senate. Though nearly a century would pass before a similar law would win passage, the NAACP's campaign played an important role in raising the association's national profile. In the years leading up to World War I, the educational building attracted a great number of peace advocates. There were so many groups, in fact, that newspapers sometimes called it the peace building. Plimpton was a trustee in the World Peace Foundation and the Church Peace Union, now the Carnegie Council, which was active at 75th Avenue for several decades. He provided office space at no charge to the New York branch of the Women's Peace Party which was founded in 1915 by the suffragists Jane Addams and Carrie Chapman Catt. Tenants with other interests included the American Neutral Conference Committee, the League to Enforce Peace, the New York Peace Society, and the Emergency Peace Federation. The American Civil Liberties Union also traces its beginnings to the educational building. Initially called the National Civil Liberties Bureau, it was founded in New York City by the American Union Against Militarism, a pacifist group headed by Lillian Wald and Crystal Eastman to provide legal advice and representation to conscientious objectors following passage of the Selective Service Act in 1917. Evicted following raids by the Justice Department in 1918, it was soon relaunched as the ACLU. Today, this important organization has offices in every state and more than a million members. Another notable tenant was the National Board of Review, founded by the People's Institute in 1909 and originally called the National Board of Censorship. For several decades, all films that gained its approval were accompanied by a screen label passed by the National Board of Review. This organization also sponsored publications devoted to film criticism, such as Film Program, called Films in Review since 1950. This influential magazine remains in print and is the oldest periodical of its kind in the United States. The Plimpton family sold 75th Avenue in 1946. In subsequent years, it had several owners, including the educational publisher, Prentice Hall, and real estate developer, Jack Browse, who published this brochure. The building's architect was Charles A. Rich, formerly of the noted firm Lamb and Rich. An understated example of the Beaux-Arts style, the white brick and possibly cast stone elevations display a tripartite configuration consisting of a three-story base, an eight-story midsection, and a two-story crown. Most of the original neoclassical ornament is well-preserved, including the door surrounds, pilasters, composite capitals, relief panels, keystones, rounded pediments, and an extensive masonry cornice. In reference to Plimpton's publishing company and the various educational tenants, the door surrounds that face West 13th Street display cartouches that frame small images of open books, while some bays on the uppermost floors have iron grills with gilded book reliefs. The New School for Social Research acquired 75th Avenue in 1972. A significant institution in Greenwich Village, it was founded in 1919 as a progressive center for adult education and now incorporates five colleges. The building was renovated in 2005 to six and is currently part of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at the Parsons School of Design slash the New School. Except for a new recessed entrance on West 13th Street and modest alterations to ground floor windows, there have been very few changes to the exterior. 
The well-preserved educational building is historically significant as the former home of the National Office of the NAACP in the early 20th century, as well as many progressive organizations that advance social justice and equality, a legacy carried on for almost 50 years by the new school. The research department strongly recommends that the educational building, 75th Avenue, be added to the commission's calendar for consideration as a New York City landmark. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kate. And commissioners, do we have any questions on this one? Commissioner Devonshire, please go ahead. Yeah. Kate, is the, um, is the cornice stonemasonry or is it terracotta? You know, we have called it stonemasonry, but I think we need to keep looking to confirm that. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll go by with some binoculars and I'll All check right. let you know. Okay, thanks. Okay. thanks. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, just one of those little historical notes. My husband's stepfather, Henry Hart, was the editor of Films and Review for many, many, many years. So oh. just, a, just a sideline. Another personal connection. It's wonderful. Any other questions, commissioners? Sorry. Okay. Really, was, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, did the new school uh, sort of on purpose um, purchase this building because of its history or what was the relationship? Between we have wondered that too. And I think, you know, we can, in our discussions with them, find out more about that. It is, you know, it's a very prominent location there, um, but this long history of educational purpose and progressive organizations really does tie in to them and what yeah. they stand for too. So. Be interesting to find that out. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I think, oh yes, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. Commissioner Lutfi, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's really not a question. Okay. But I just wanna say, I don't know, uh, the potential designation of this building is so moving and important right now at this particular time um, in our history, um, the city's history and in the country's history. And I just think all of the amazing um, institutions and organizations that, oh, you know, were composites of this, this building, this wonderful building, just uh, speak to the important issues that are before us. So I really appreciate that it's coming before us right now. Yeah, it, it, it is very significant right now. And I think this, this legacy of social justice and progressive work, uh, organizations, I think is more important now than ever to recognize. I, I couldn't agree more. Right. So, well, with that moving statement, Commissioner Lusty, I think we'll take that as a motion, and I'll, I'll formally do it, a motion to calendar this item for a future public hearing. And I'm unmuting all of you or requesting to so we can call this vote. Okay, all in favor of calendaring 75th Avenue as an individual landmark, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so this item is calendar and we will see all three of these um, for public hearings in the near future and really excited about it and looking forward to your participation in these. Great, thank you. And now we'll move to the preservation agenda. Thanks, Sarah, uh, and good morning, commissioners. Corey Harala, Director of Preservation. We're gonna start with uh, our public meeting items. First one is item number one. This is LPC 21-03122 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the, in the borough of Manhattan, block 564, lot 19, 827 to 831 Broadway, uh, the 827 to 831 Broadway building's individual landmark. This is a pair of Italianate style commercial palaces with neo grec style elements designed by Griffith Thomas and built in 1866 to 67. The application is to construct rooftop additions and install storefronts and signage. This was last presented at the public meeting of December 15th, 2020, and no action was taken at that time. And commissioners, as you may recall, uh, this item came before us last month, seeking to reaffirm the commission approval from 2015. In 2015, the commission approved a revised proposal for a rooftop addition. 
That proposal was uh, initially presented as a four-story addition, and in response to commissioner's comments, the proposal was revised to three stories above the landmark and seven stories set back and primarily off the landmark site. Uh, and as was discussed in, in December, the approval was challenged in court and the judge ruled on technical issues, finding that the commission should have held a public hearing to review the revised proposal. So we did hold that hearing last December and after the hearing, the commissioner's comments were mixed, some reaffirming their original approval, finding that the addition had an architectural relationship to the building below and the taller portion in the background would recede. Others felt that the approval of the main addition was appropriate, but felt in retrospect that the taller portion of the back of the site should be reduced. And some commissioners felt uh, that the main addition should be reduced to be less visible over the landmark. Um, so today the applicants have returned with a response that addresses some of the commissioner's concerns and will present the changes after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you, Corey. All right, and Commissioner Chapin, can we have a motion to open the proceedings? Motion to open the proceedings. Okay, and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, so the proceedings are open and the applicant may begin. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Jordan Rogoff from DXA Studio here. Um, I am taking control of the screen here. Um, here to uh, return with uh, some revisions that we made based on our presentation in December for 831 Broadway. And I'm having trouble, one moment here, there we go. All right, um, so um, when we presented last, uh, last month, there were uh, two concerns stated, uh, kind of two groups uh, of commissioners uh, with concerns first for the uh, overall visibility of the addition that's being proposed, the three-story addition on top of uh, the Broadway uh, uh, building or Broadway portion of the building. Uh, and uh, there is a, um, uh, a concern about the amount of visibility and perhaps it should be reduced a little bit. Uh, there was also uh, a concern expressed about the visibility of the tower portion and that is the F, the area that was uh, uh, redistributed from the initial design uh, and, and reappropriated to the uh, East 12th Street uh, portion of the lot, which was not part of the designation. And so some felt that that tower was uh, a little too tall. So in response to those concerns in December, uh, what we've done is um, on the Broadway side, uh, we, we had a really uh, difficult time on the floor to floors uh, on the three story addition. So reduction wasn't possible. So what we did is actually push the facade back uh, to the, the first uh, row of columns that we had. So that it's gone back about two and a half feet or 30 inches uh, to reduce some visibility. And then on the tower side, uh, we've actually removed an entire floor of the tower. Uh, dropping that down from 11 stories to 10 stories. Uh, so here, uh, this is the uh, site. Again, it's two lots merged. Uh, one uh, uh, part of the lot, the A27 portion, has a, a tail uh, where that, that the uh, back portion of that lot comes out on the East 12th Street. So that's the location of, the, of, of what we're calling the tower. Uh, and then the red uh, area is the uh, area that's been designated for the building. That's 827 and 831 Broadway. Uh, here is a montage elevation, which is helpful when we uh, start to talk about visibility, some of the adjacent buildings being tall and obscuring visibility from a number of vantage points. Uh, massing and design, pretty straightforward. If you can see my cursor, uh, on the Broadway portion, what we've done is we've gone from 36 of a setback to 38 foot six. So that's back to the kind of uh, column line uh, for, for the addition. Uh, and then on the tower portion, we re removed a whole uh, story. Uh, and so we've gone down from 11 stories uh, to 10 stories, offsetting some of that area uh, for full transparency here. We've we pushed uh, a little bit of the area. We've grown the floor plate uh, from what was a 23 foot setback to a 20 foot setback. So that recoups uh, a fraction of the area lost uh, in the uh, total square footage um, by reducing the floor uh, and reducing the footprint of the Broadway portion. So you see here again, 38 foot uh, six setback 
uh, and then this being reduced from 11 stories to 10 stories. So visibility studies, I wanna acknowledge that um, uh, yesterday evening we received a package prepared by uh, the opposition's uh, architect that we reviewed. And I can get into specifics about our analysis of that, uh, of reviewing their materials. Um, but first and foremost, I wanna say what we're presenting to you here, we have the utmost confidence in our visibility studies. Uh, unlike the opposition's architect, we had the benefit of three months of study with Langen Engineering uh, perform performing a series of uh, what are called cloud point uh, 3D scans uh, of, of our building and the adjacent building. And so the model that we built uh, is absolutely accurate. Uh, and the vantage points and visibility studies that we're gonna show you are based on that. The opposition's architect did not have the benefit of three months and uh, several weeks of, of, of engineers uh, scanning all of the adjacent buildings. So anyway, the, the first slide that I'm showing here, this is what we presented in December. Uh, and this is what we're presenting now with the reduction of the, the full floor on the tower uh, and the reduced visibility, albeit incrementally of pushing this facade back an additional two and a half feet. Uh, here are visibility studies going uh, down Broadway and again, um, when we compared this to the opposition package that we received last night, there, there are a few kind of key points um, that are worth bringing up. One is uh, in their visibility studies, there were no bulkheads or, or rooftop additions to any of the adjacent buildings, which uh, do contribute to uh, mitigating visibility from some vantage points. So they, they must be included in doing a, uh, like an authentic, meaningful, uh, review of visibility. Uh, the other issue we found is uh, that the um, overall tower height appears to be about five feet taller relative to the base building. Um, being that we just received it last night, you know, we could do a full forensics of it, but we, um, uh, right off the bat, it looks like the, that many of the adjacent building heights are, are off. Uh, and and uh, we, uh, again, stand by uh, these, this series of visibility studies throughout. So um, one, other, one other thing to bring up, I think, is that there were comments about um, two-point perspective versus three-point perspective. Uh, that really has to do with lens correction, not amount of visibility. If anything, in, in 2D perspective, uh, it's really just correcting uh, distortion that you might have. Uh, in, in uh, the kind of peripheral buildings, but won't affect what, what's happening in the middle of the lens, which is where uh, the image is, is framed. So our visibility studies are a collection of, of two point and three point perspective. Three point perspective is probably most important uh, in views like that directly across from the street, which we'll get into in a moment here. Um, but anyway, uh, comparatively visibility studies uh, showing vantage points from Union Square uh, moving south. Um, you'll see uh, that the reduction of the tower is quite significant from that vantage point, uh, particularly uh, uh, view three. Uh, right across the street, uh, we can assure you that there is no visibility of, of the uh, rooftop addition on Broadway directly across the street. And this vantage point is done uh, at a height of six feet. Uh, so that's eye level of six feet. So that's a six and a half to seven foot tall person, uh, the most extreme uh, kind of uh, metric um, and, and something that we've known uh, is the preference of, uh, of, of landmarks uh, to model as such. So we're not gonna have any visibility uh, here. Again, what we think the opposition's architect rendered the facade of the building uh, down a couple of feet and the uh, addition rather than the sloped roof and inset that we have uh, with the addition, it was built directly atop as though the roof came straight back, if that makes uh, any sense. Probably a poor description on my part. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the rooftop addition was, was modeled much taller than, than what we're proposing. Um, and it's, it's hard for us to, to say definitively since none of their drawings had dimensions uh, accompanying them. Um, so here are visibility studies from uh, additional vantage points uh, down East 13th Street. So east of Broadway looking west. Uh, this is what we presented to you in December. Uh, this is with the revisions to the Broadway building and the reduction of the tower height. Uh, 
uh, down below. Um, additional visibility studies going more eastward, uh, looking west uh, from more vantage points as requested. Uh, and you see again, the tower uh, is reduced uh, and that, that area of visibility uh, lasts from really the corner of Broadway going east uh, between 100 and about 150 feet before buildings obscure it. So this again is the rendering directly across the street at an eye level of six feet up against the uh, building, uh, the uh, street wall. Uh, and then more comparative renderings that we showed you in December versus the reduction uh, uh, and revisions that we've made today. And again, no visibility from this vantage point. We did additional studies, which I believe are in the appendix, kind of moving up and down East 12th Street in response to uh, the opposition's architect. Uh, and then these are just some images of the um, slump glass facade that we had proposed uh, for, uh, for the addition on Broadway, an elevation of that slumped glazing. Uh, and then this is one of uh, several documents uh, produced over the course of our some three months of, of site evaluation. Uh, first with the New York um, uh, land uh, engineers. And then we also worked, as I mentioned, with Langen that has really sophistic sophisticated equipment. It does a three dimensional scan. It's what's called a cloud point. So it's a series of data points uh, spatially. Um, that that profile all of the adjacent buildings and all of the heights of our building, both interior and exterior. So we we stand by the veracity of the documents that we put together in all of these site studies, and we commit to over the course uh, uh, moving forward, working with staff uh, to allay uh, any concerns uh, throughout the process. Um, so that's really kind of the 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 gist of of our presentation today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, uh, about any concerns that might have arisen from that last minute document shared with all of us. Okay, thank you. Yes, and as you said, that the document was shared with not only you, but with the commissioners as well as um, other uh, written comments that we've received. Commissioner Bland, do you have a question? Just uh, there, Commissioner. I am mute. I can actually ask the question. Um, is this latest scheme uh, uh, built as a mock-up? The latest scheme, uh, a physical mock-up is quite difficult. Uh, it's it's a real building project, uh, as it'd be three stories above the uh, existing building. The existing building has a sloped roof and lots of skylights, and the skylights were really kind of part of what drew. Uh, many of the artists to the building in the beginning, um, but it makes it quite uh, precarious to build a uh, build a mock up. Okay, uh, I, I hear you, but I also want to continue the thought a little bit more. Sure. Uh, we've uh, over the course of my time on this commission, which is now nearly I guess thirteen plus years, several times we've had uh, applicants come back when their uh, the actuality of what was built did not jibe with what was uh, shown to us. In very accurate, the, the applicants always said, uh, renderings. Uh, and what did we do? Uh, it was a violation. So what did we do? Did we allow them or did we not? Uh, and I guess the, the, the record, uh, which Sarah will know better than I or Mark, but in at least several cases, we made them rip out and, uh, and start over. So the jeopardy is significant. And again, I, I haven't been up on that roof. I can't assess, but I'm hearing you say that. But I'm just also suggesting that the jeopardy for you and your client is a significant one if this is inaccurate. And here we are, uh, you know, 11 commissioners uh, confronted with two credible architects giving us uh, uh, different viewpoints. And uh, with the exception of what you've just said regarding the difficulty of, of making uh, uh, you know, a, um, an accurate uh, 
or, or credible um, uh, rendition of, of physically what's there. So we don't have to rely on this digital technology or that digital technology, but the actual facts, it would seem to me to be worth your while to maybe to try to figure that out rather than having these two dueling um, versions of this uh, and, and perhaps ultimately a big error uh, that would require demolition of what you build. So I'm just throwing that out yeah. there. Other commissioners may have points of view and you, you too uh, may have a point of view about this. So that was yeah. my long question and comment and I'll now go back on mute. Yeah, but if that's okay if I can respond to that. Um, I, I, I hear you. Uh, and if I didn't have the utmost confidence in our analysis, that would be something that would keep me up at night. Um, I think that we realize the importance of getting the visibility right early on. And that's why we brought in multiple engineers and spent so much time on site. So I think relative our study relative to the other architects is that I think they had upwards of a day to prepare. Uh, and we had several months to keep going back to the site and keep testing theories and, and studying by different means. So I, I feel very good about um, our, our studies. As far as uh, a mock-up, I guess from our perspective, uh, from the beginning, we, we knew that this would be visible, uh, that, that when we're talking about um, mock-ups that oftentimes those are to make sure that something is either minimally visible or not visible. And that hasn't been a standard that I think that we pursued uh, from the beginning. So I think we've been up front that uh, even just a little bit of visibility uh, would, would be part of, of what we wanted to do to celebrate um, uh, through our design, uh, the significance of, of what happened inside the building. In, in a way, broadcast uh, by some means, uh, the, the importance of that building for a building that people have walked by for, for decades. Um, so so uh, we've made no secret of our wish to, to make it uh, visible from at least some vantage points. Right, and if I could just add one or two more sentences to my yeah. one question. Um, for me, it's never been a question of, is it visible or not? Not, not just on your application here, but for all, all the years I've served, it's whether that visibility is appropriate uh, uh, to be seen versus the building below it. And, um, and I will say right, right now that, if, if, that I, I can support your most recent um, um, design as minimally visible, a little bit visible, that's okay with me. Other commissioners may have a completely different point of view about all of this, I understand. But I still am going back and worrying about, for you, if we approve this and it comes out not to be what you, what it, what you said it was. I mean, it's very, very clear here. You've given us the evidence. Uh, I can't believe that uh, this commission is going to say, oh, okay, okay, well, that's fine. Given all of the controversy over this, it will be ripped out and changed. And uh, that's a big deal in a, in a building project, I understand. Thank you. Yes. But to your point, Commissioner Bland, it is true that we uh, make decisions based on the materials before us. And if there are inaccuracies in renderings, the commission does require often applicants, unless they can find it appropriate, they often require applicants to um, undo the work that has been done to ensure that it's compliant. And so it that those materials are part of the approval and they're contingent upon their accuracy. Um, and you know, we the staff can also maybe work um, into the permit some con language about monitoring it during construction to make sure it's on the right track as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Carroll, that was actually what I was going to uh, ask about specifically, which is a follow on to Commissioner Bland's uh, inquiry that uh, addressing this before the project is completed while it's in construction that either you or the council might address, uh, you know, our ability to, uh, you know, monitor the construction and see if it in fact is exceeding uh, what was anticipated 
so it could be stopped before it's actually uh, at the point where we're removing a lot of structure. So, yeah. so that was my question. Thank you. Right. And I think one could work out uh, pit points during the construction schedule to establish as monitoring points. Hey, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, uh, Sarah, thank you. Um, this, this is a, a difficult one because we have on, you know, being a, a skeptical New Yorker, on the one hand, I have an, a, an applicant who has a, a vested financial interest in putting this forward and, and assuring us that their images are accurate. And another architect equally esteemed um, saying that the images are not. I, I sort of agree with Fred that I'm, I'm almost on the, the fence about um, this being acceptable, but I'm, I'm assuming it's acceptable only because I have that two dimensional image to look at. And I, you know, no small, no small thing for me is the fact that they refer to it as an official site survey which means that somebody's not thinking about someone, something while they're going along with this. In any case, my greatest comfort level would be to have them erect a mock-up. And I can't see how it would be so completely onerous and difficult for them to, to do that rather than face the possibility of having to disassemble something that they've constructed in steel later on rather than constructing something with with aluminum two by fours now and and remove any question whatsoever thanks sorry okay all right other questions all right oh uh, yes commissioner bland did you have another one again just just to really put it out there for me if the helper and study were accurate I would not vote for this project the way it is. If the current applicant's proposal is accurate, I would vote for it. So, I mean, just to illustrate the conundrum that I personally feel. And I agree with that. And, and I also- And that's agree. clear. Okay, that's, that's clear on the record, so that's helpful. Okay, any other questions, Commissioner Jefferson? I also agree with that. I think a mock-up would help me make a precise decision, A or B. Thank you. All right, and well, one thought is um, if, as we do often with large, larger additions that we know will be visible when we don't require mock-ups, we base <clears throat> our approvals on the materials before us, which um, have been explained to be accurate for various reasons using the, the engineering tools that um, were available to them. And, um, and it's clear that the, um, anything beyond what is shown in these materials would not be found appropriate. Um, would commissioners be comfortable make, doing, taking an action uh, based on the materials today contingent upon a mock-up prior to construction for the staff to verify that it accurately represents the um, images presented, the materials presented today. And, and the monitoring that you mentioned earlier. And the so monitoring. It, and yeah. the monitoring built into the construction schedule. Yeah. Yes. Would, would the commissioners be advised of the, the presence of the mock-up? We can do that. Uh, Sarah, it's probably also worth clarifying. We're talking about a mock-up of the three-story addition on the individual landmarks. And also I wanted to kind of point out when we have that other projects with large additions, like the uh, recent approval at Terminal Stores Warehouse, which was a much, much larger addition. They did not mock up the entire thing, but they did partial mock-ups, hitting corners and things like that to avoid structure because there were limitations on height. And so given what the architect here has said about issues with the roof and skylights, it may be that they can do half of the width of the addition in a mock-up but not the whole thing. So I think maybe some flexibility with that would be in order as well, if the commissioners agree. Okay, 
Okay, are there questions? All right, so before we move to the discussion, um, we did receive a number of letters and those have all been shared with the commissioners, as you know, you've received them. Um, but just for the record, we, uh, Rich, will you summarize those? Yes, so we have received 26 letters in opposition, including nearby residents, the attorney representing certain members of the public, and from GVSHP. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll move to our discussion, and I'm going to start to unmute those of you who are not already unmuted. And we'll begin, um, and you know, Corey uh, laid this out well in the beginning, I think that um, the last time we saw this, there were some commissioners who reaffirmed and remained supportive of their original approval. Um, others who felt that the main addition was fine, but that the tower at the back needed to be reduced and then others who in retrospect weren't sure about the size of the addition in itself, the main addition. And so um, as we saw today, the applicants have adjusted both portions of the addition, setting the main addition back and lowering the taller addition at the back by a floor. And so, um, you know, Commissioner Bland, I think um, you've already stated that if this were contingent upon uh, a mock-up prior to construction and monitoring and based on the visibility, I think that you felt today that you were comfortable with the amount. Did I accurately you, say that? You absolutely did. And and I would vote to accept this and as, as an appropriate um, uh, application. But again, I'm, I'm just wanting to see that mock-up as opposed to a finished product that we have to then say, oops, big problem, let's demolish it and start over. Right, right, okay. All right, and Commissioner Chapin, last uh, month you remained supportive of the original approval, but said that you could go either way. And now that they have made some changes to both portions of the addition, and we've discussed these contingencies, how are you feeling today? Commissioner Chapin? Uh, no, I said uh, I, I basically agree with uh, the positions uh, expressed by uh, Michael and okay. well, about, and, and Fred in particular. Uh, and I, I feel that it has moved to the point where I could approve it based, based on the revisions as long as they are accurately represented. Okay, great. Great. And Commissioner Goldblum, you also remained supportive of the original approval, maintaining that the addition was appropriate because it related to the architecture below. And are you still comfortable given the changes today and the discussion today? Totally. Okay, great. And Commissioner Holford Smith, I think you also found that the addition was an interesting abstraction of the facade below and that the portion in the back might recede. And you know, I think that would be even more so. And are you still comfortable today? Yes. I think lowering the, the, the tower by one floor actually is a big improvement over the previous and pushing the, the addition back. But I still think okay. seeing that addition is acceptable over the, over the facade. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Chen, you also um, felt support of finding the architecture related to the building below. Are you comfortable with the proposal today and some of the con contingencies we've discussed? Yes. Uh, also, uh, I'm very glad to see the uh, the back. Uh, they lower by one story, so that really uh, enhances it, uh, uh, reduces the visibility. Okay, great. And Commissioner Shamir Baron, you were actually one of the commissioners who specifically had um, spoken about the taller portion last time. You were comfortable with the main addition as being appropriate, but really felt the taller portion needed to be lowered and. So I wonder how you're feeling today after seeing that revision. I think the revision helps a lot and um, I can support it as presented. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, you also um, specifically commented on the taller portion last time. And I think we're comfortable with, not troubled by the front edition, but uh, more uncomfortable with the taller portion. And, and how are your feelings today? I, I can support it. <clears throat> I can support it. Um, if the renderings are accurate, I'm, I can support it. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson? 
How are you feeling with the changes and the contingencies? Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Bland's position um, and uh, particularly how he stated that if it was if we knew right now that it was um, inaccurate or that the other um, drawings were accurate, I wouldn't be approving it. Um, I am uh, concerned about um, Corey's comment because I do not think it is helpful to invite the applicant to um, do anything short of try to do a full scale mock up and only if they absolutely can't. Um, otherwise, we're going to end up in another debate about um, whether they did the mock up sufficiently to show the visibility. So I think the effort should be to do 100% of it. Um, and, and you know, they've, they've got, you know, terrific engineers involved here. I, I would be shocked that they could build the building, but they couldn't build the mock-up. Um, that would be surprising. So um, right. I think that every effort should be made to build the entire mock-up. And, uh, and, and if it is impossible, then I, I suppose we can back off that. But um, Otherwise, I agree with Commissioner Bland. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire? I'm in, in concept, um, I am in favor of the changes that they made. But as I said, I have a high discomfort level about um, approving this without a full mock-up. Okay. All right. So I think um, that we have a consensus to approve today. Um, finding that the addition itself is uh, relates architecturally to the building below and that the taller portions, the reduction in the taller portion and the setback of the main addition um, help to really make this addition subservient to the main building and kind of read into the background of roofscape and, and, and the streetscape. Um, however, that is contingent upon the uh, applicants doing a mock-up prior to construction, working with staff on that, and we can share that with commissioners, and um, also building in um, monitoring into their construction schedule. Um, Commissioner Goldblum, could you make that motion? Sarah, Sarah, can I just, just for the yes. record, can we just note that uh, Jeannie is, has been recused in the past? Oh, and I'm sorry. Recused. Uh, has not been participating in this thing. Yes, she has not been present for the entire meeting, and I apologize to mention that at the beginning. Do you want me to rec do you want me to do this with a uh, uh, um, a comment at the end with about the, the mock-up? Yeah, that it's a, that. However, you know that it's contingent upon a mock-up and a, uh, a monitoring built into the construction schedule. Very good. All right, regarding 827 to 831 Broadway, an individual landmark, the application is to construct rooftop additions and install signage and storefronts. Uh, I uh, note that um, the uh, 827 831 Broadway buildings are twin Civil War era commercial palaces designed by Griffith Thomas and built in 1866 through 67. After World War II, 827 to 831 Broadway buildings gained considerable cultural significance for their association with abstract expressionist art movement and the artists who lived and worked there, including Willem, Willem de Kooning, Elaine de Kooning, Paul Jenkins, Larry Poons, and the curator William Rubin, symbolizing an important moment in New York City history and in the history of art. The commission further notes, I further note, that this portion of the of Broadway, just south of Union Square, contains a diversity of building types and heights, primarily characterized by late 19th and early 20th century store and loft buildings with typical building heights ranging from four to 12 stories. The commission, find, I finally know that the historic Art Nouveau style storefront at A27 Broadway was installed in the late 1970s and at the storefront at A31 Broadway was constructed to match fabric and was installed in the early 1980s, I recommend approval <coughs> with modifications. Finding that the construction of the proposed rooftop addition, stair and elevator bulkhead and storefront alterations when eliminate or cause damage to any significant architectural features, that the buildings were designed primarily for their cultural association with the abstract expressionist art movement and therefore the visible addition that is set back considerably from and differentiated from the primary facades preserving the identity of the existing buildings and which has a design that references both the architectural <coughs> and cultural significance of the buildings 
will not diminish the special art character of the landmark. But the proposed addition will be set back from the primary facades and will not be visible from directly in front of the buildings on Broadway. But the eight bay facade configuration of the addition defined by the visible grid of pyramidal concrete structural columns will reflect the rhythm and proportion of window openings at the historic building. Building. Featuring a slump formed laminated glass pin. I, I took it off. They're, they're doing 831 Broadway right yet. We'll recall the coin details on historic buildings and is inspired by the painterly techniques of distortion and reflection found in Willem de Kooning's abstract expressionist paintings that the visible secondary facade of the addition clad in matte, matte dark gray metal rain screen featuring a 2D etched grid pattern will be in keeping with the simple articulation of secondary facades within the streetscape. That almost all of the six story addition will be located off the landmark site uh, and, loc and oriented at an angle toward the south, thereby visually disassociating it from the des designated historic buildings on Broadway and relating it to the undesignated 12th Street building. That the simple rectilinear design and materials of the 12th Street addition, featuring the dark matte gray zinc cladding on the prominent lot line facade and glass curtain wall, will be in keeping with the treatment of secondary facades within the streetscapes and therefore will not compete with the articulation of the new Broadway addition or the historic building that the existing storefront at 831 Broadway was constructed in the 1980s to match the salvaged Art Nouveau storefront at 827 Broadway. And therefore its removal will not cause the elimination of any significant historic fabric. That the proposed wood storefront at 831 Broadway featuring two display windows with arch transoms and paneled bulkheads, double entrance doors and pin mounted metal signage and uplighting will recall the arched headed windows at the upper stories of the building as well as the arched transoms found in historic images of the building from 1899 and will harmonize with the ground floor treatments of the buildings within the streetscape. That the proposed interactive plaque at the ground floor will be affixed to the facade with adhesive and will therefore not require penetrations through the cast iron pilaster and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. However, <clears throat> I recommend that the applicant work with the staff to uh, install a mock-up before any construction begins uh, that uh, confirms the visibility studies uh, provided in the submission and that this mock-up is uh, reviewed with staff and confirmed before uh, construction continues. I think we're also going to... Bland. <clears throat> So Sorry, did, go ahead, Mark. Did, did you want to have, uh, and there will be, and there will be periodic uh, confirmation during construction. Yeah. And addition, additionally, uh, the uh, applicant will work with the staff to uh, verify that the mock-up and the visibility studies have been adhered to uh, through periodic inspections of the work as it proceeds. Second, second. Thank you, Commissioner Bland. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor, none, none opposed, the motion carries. <laughs> All right, thank you. So that's approved with those modifications and we'll move to the next item. Thank you. The next item is public meeting item number two, LPC 21-03913, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1322, lot 107. 211 East 48th Street, the Lascaz House Individual Landmark, a modern style residence and office building designed by William Lascaz and built 1933 to 34. The application is to extend and reconstruct the rear facade excavate the rear yard, construct a rooftop addition and extend chimneys. Uh, this was read into the record last week at the public hearing of January 12th, 2021, uh, but is being presented today for the first time. I believe we need to open the hearing. All right, motion, uh, yes. all right. All right, Commissioner Halford Smith, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? 
second. Okay, and now just if everybody could unmute right now. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is open and the application may begin. You now have control of slides and remember to unmute yourself. Uh, state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners, landmark staff, and to the public that's logged in. Thank you for the opportunity to present this project. My name is Alex Nijakovsky, and along with Wayne Tourette, we are of the Tourette Collaborative, and we represent the owner of 211 East 48th Street, the Lascaux House. So I'm going to apologize in advance for the, the length of the presentation. I'll make an effort to move through this as quickly as possible. But as you know, it's a unique property, and it's a broad scope of work. So it can take a little bit of time to get through the, the various parts of it. Uh, as mentioned, the proposed scope of work is for a rooftop addition, rear facade extension, lowering of the rear yard, um, as well as exterior restoration, which is being worked at at staff level. Um, I'd also like to add that we've been working with staff for the past few months to try to develop and fine tune the scope of this work. And we've also been working with various fabricators to track down original or matching materials for the house, as well as with the Lascaz archive at Syracuse University to find original drawings, letters and articles related to the house. So as a brief overview, the property is located on the north side of East 48th Street, seen here between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. It's part of a row of townhomes on the north side of the block, and it's bracketed by taller towers to the corner, a office tower at 3rd Avenue, and an apartment building at 2nd Avenue. The house itself is an individual landmark. It's recognized at the local, state, and national levels, and it's adjacent to the Turtle Bay Gardens Historic District, just to the east down the block. Uh, just to give a brief historic uh, overview, William Lascaz was one of a number of prominent European-born architects who moved to the U.S. in the first half of the 20th century and helped the spread of European-influenced modernism in this country. Though well-known and respected in his own time, Lascaz's legacy and portfolio of work never grew to the level of some of his contemporaries. Some of his best-known designs, though, are for the series of townhomes he built in Manhattan, along with a series of office towers that he collaborated on. The house at 211 East 48th was built by Lascaz as his private residence, as well as his architectural office, an opportunity to design for his own needs, as well as to showcase his work to potential clients. And though the house has a distinctly modern design, the actual structure dates back to the 1860s when this property was developed as the series of townhomes that are visible today. The original structure of the home is still there. It was enlarged and covered by the Lascaz renovation and enlargement in 1933-34. So during that renovation, he removed the original front facade and built out the modern uh, crisp white stucco and glass block facade that you see today, pushed out about three and a half feet to the front lot line. At the rear, he replaced the common brick facade with a more modern glazed brick, as well as introduced the curved bay at the second floor. And lastly, he took over most of the rear yard to extend the basement, creating his uh, home studio or his, the office in his home. Um, with this kind of split level terrace and then leaving a very shallow front yard, a very shallow rear yard of about 10 feet at the very back. Um, moving forward, this, uh, this cutaway section, which is from original drawings that were submitted to Architectural Forum in 1934, shows the organization of the house. In orange, we've highlighted the basement level studio, which extends nearly the full depth of the property and has its own separate entrance from the street with a glass block facade that's recessed and matches that above. And then in blue, you see the three stories of the residence above. There's a number of exterior spaces, mainly the split level terrace above the studio at the first floor, as well as the shallow front yard and a small front area way. Like most townhomes, the roof was not meant to be an amenity space. It was mainly a service space, just accessed through this hatch, which is shown here. And over time, it grew a series of accretions in the form of mechanical bulkheads mechanical units on dunnage, vents, etc. You can see that original to it was the skylight at the center. Now, we did find evidence in our research of the Lascaz archive that there was correspondence between Lascaz and his associate, which discussed the potential for a penthouse extension on the roof. And there was also a change order from the contractor at the time, pricing out additional steel at the roof to support a future penthouse, as well as structural provisioning for a stair leading up to the roof. We haven't been able to find any drawings that show this, just the correspondence. 
On this slide, you could see the block elevation with where our property fits into the row of townhomes. You could see there's a bit of variation in the townhomes as well as a number of rooftop additions that already exist along with the two towers at either corner. This is the same slide. It shows our addition added to the, the roof of the house. And again, how it kind of keeps in scale with other additions on the block. And then some additional information here, photographs of townhomes with existing rooftop additions on that block, as well as the view from our roof looking east towards these various rooftop additions. So moving on to the specifics of the work proposed, these are the existing front and rear facades. Um, as I mentioned, there's a fair amount of restorative work that we're working with staff to develop for the front facade, the glass block and the stucco. So we'll have some of the ornamental metalwork. At the rooftop, we're proposing to remove this accretion of mechanical bulkheads and units and dunnage, um, as well as vents to facilitate the rooftop addition. And then at the rear facade, our proposal is to carefully deconstruct the rear facade, salvaging the existing glazed brick. The existing windows, the openings are original, but the windows are non-original, so the windows would not be salvaged. But we would then rebuild that facade six feet further to the north. There'll be additional drawings that show this. Using the same brick and matching the same design, we would then introduce new windows uh, to better match what was originally there, which were steel windows. Um, and we would keep the window layout the same, except for the first floor, which we'll describe in more detail. So this is the proposed view. Here you see the rooftop addition. It would be finished in plaster, sorry, in stucco to, to match the existing front facade, both in the finish and the color. And it would just have a single large opening at the front. The same would be at the rear of the rooftop addition. The chimneys, which are shared with the neighbors, would need to be raised by three feet above the roof level. So those chimney extensions are shown here and are shown in the mock-up photos later on. And then here you see the rear facade reconstructed to match what's there presently, just six feet further north. The only difference being that we would need to introduce transoms into the windows at the first floor in order to provide sufficient light and air for those spaces. Right now, they, they don't work the way that they're configured. Um, Additionally, in, a, in the future slides, you'll see some work to skylights and to the terraces. There's also other facades, given the way the building is sort of stepped. So this is the full rear facade of the basement level. So we're proposing here to clean and repoint and restore the brick that's there. This is just regular common brick. It's not glazed brick like the rest of the house. We would replace the windows. Um, and in lowering the rear yard, which currently has this kind of two level uh, design, there's photos that'll better explain this, we would bring this all down to the lower of the basement levels and we would replace the existing door and windows with a large opening with sliders. There's also some restorative work proposed for planters and other windows in the kind of split level of the terraces and uh, existing planters that would be utilized as skylights to get light into the basement level. So here you see the section. Uh, again, the existing accretions on the roof, as well as the roof itself, would be removed and reconstructed. The demolition of the rear facade and a portion of the terrace here with the glass block skylights to push it six feet out, and the lowering of the rear yard. In the proposed section, you see the rooftop addition. We're proposing to lower the roof level itself by a foot in order to minimize the height of this addition and its visibility over the front parapet. And the addition is set back such that it's not directly visible over the front of the house. We have mock-ups and visibility studies that show where there is visibility. And a similar approach is taken at the rear where the rear of the addition is set back such that when you're standing at the upper terrace at the back of it, you don't see the top of that addition over the parapet. Here you see the lowered rear yard. Um, we would be proposing to add a skylight over this split level basement area to provide legal light and air into it as well as some of the restorative work at the rear yard. And then these are just uh, kind of enlargements of those areas. So again, the rear yard kind of has this split level design where you exit out from the lower level and then there are a few steps to a raised planter. That raised planter is partially failing right now. We'll show photos of this. Um, and then the shifting of the rear facade six feet out, which would require eliminating one of the glass block skylights here. This is the new position of the rear facade. The dashed red line represents the old position. 
Um, and here you see the kind of uniform level of the rear yard at the lower level of the split level. These photos show the condition of the rear yard. So from the roof looking down, you see the existing split level terraces with the glass block skylights, the same views here. This glazing is not original, so it would be replaced. Uh, these planters would also be converted into skylights. And then at the actual rear yard behind the basement extension, you see the condition of the existing brick and the various conduits and accretions back there, as well as this raised planter and the kind of narrow stairwell and part of the brick that's heaving from the soil here. So we're proposing to remove and lower all of this. Moving on. So at the uh, enlargement of the roof, again, there's an existing mechanical bulkhead as well as this equipment, which is to be removed. These are the three chimneys shared with the neighbors, two along the west and one on the east, which would be raised above the level of the new addition. And here you see the enlarged section of the new addition. So you can see that the new roof level is a foot below the existing roof level. Um, the overall height of the addition relative to this new roof or new fourth floor and the extension of the chimneys above that, as well as the setbacks from the front and the rear. And these are photos of the existing roof condition. So again, you can see there's sort of a, a mess of equipment, some of it original, some of it added over time. And then in this exonometric cutaway, you see the profile of the existing house, again, with the rear facade to be pulled back and the rear yard to be lowered. And then the view of the proposed. So the rooftop on the lowered roof, the new position of the rear facade reconstructed to match and the uniform level lowered of the rear yard. Lastly, just moving through some mock-up photos here. Um, you can see that the view from directly across the uh, street, you would not see any of the addition. You would see the tops of the chimneys when they're raised, poking out. This existing condenser is to be removed. Um, the visibility increases as you move to the west towards Third Avenue. So you begin to catch glimpses of the upper portion of the, the rooftop addition. Moving further west, then the west face of the addition is exposed along with the, uh, the south face. You also note though that in this view, both of these views, you begin to see portions of other neighboring additions which are partially visible as well. We feel like our addition is kind of keeping in that scale. Um, and then the most visible portions are from across the intersection at Third Avenue and 48th because the office tower on the corner has this plaza and steps back significantly. It exposes the Western face of the proposed addition. And then to the East, there's again from the plaza here. And then to the east, the visibility is relatively minor. Again, as you move east down the block, you catch portions of the southeast corner, as well as the raised chimney. So you see that here. Uh, and then this is a view of the, the mock up as it's constructed. At the rear, we mocked up the projection of the upper parapet uh, six feet further north into the rear yard. So that's what this green band recommends, uh, sorry, represents. And here we did a simple photo montage, which basically superimposes the existing rear facade six feet further out based on the position of this mock-up. You could see that though it's proud of the neighbors, the relationship relative to the, the rear yard and neighboring buildings isn't significantly changed from, from what's existing there. And lastly, I won't spend too much time on this. These are just some of the restorative elements that we're working with staff. So the glass block is in various stages of failure. We're looking to repair those as possible. Um, repointing and cleaning some of the brickwork at the back, uh, as well as restoring, cleaning and repainting the stucco and some of the chipping paint that's on the front and also repainting the, uh, the metal elements. And these are some of the, the representative materials there. Again, this is all being worked at at staff level. And finally, uh, existing plans of the house and the position of the rear facade and proposed plans with that facade extended. And that's it. So I'd like to thank you guys for, for your time and for kind of following along with us to understand this unique and complex home. You know, roughly 70 years after the property was originally built, Lascaz undertook to expand and renovate the property to reflect the architecture of his time and the personal needs of his own family and his business. 
He did this by surgically cutting and adding to the existing structure, grafting old onto new. And now 90 years after that time, the current owner is proposing to restore elements of this house to their 1930s condition, while at the same time respectfully updating and adapting this house to meet the current times and their own needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We do have a question, Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. Yes, just in reference to that very last point, um, a question about, if, in case you've said it before and I missed it, what were the um, additions or changes that Lascaz himself made? Mm -hmm. Sure. So let me, I mean, the, the most prominent one, obviously, is the front facade. He removed the front facade of the building and pulled the entire building forward by three and a half feet, which is why it's proud of its neighbors on the row. And, and what you know, year was that? This was 1933, 1934. That, that, that he moved it forward? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and then the other, let me flip back. Here. Okay, I'll go back to the exonometric because that's maybe a little easier to understand. Uh, here. So then also he removed the rear facade of the house and constructed this new rear facade in the same plane as the original rear facade, but with a new material and with this kind of curved bay at the second floor. And then the final major change. Okay, what year was that? It was all in the same year. It was all in the same phase, all in 1933-34. <laughs> Um, and then the final piece was extending the basement level nearly all the way to the rear lot line. So previously there would have been a rear yard here like any other townhouse. Um, he extended this and constructed this kind of split level yard and this split level basement, which was used as his studio. So those are the three major changes all done in 1933-34. Commissioner Devonshire, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, you, you mentioned visible um, rooftop additions on other buildings on the block. Mm -hmm. Are any of them individual landmarks? Mm, no, I don't believe so, but I do believe, mm -hmm. I believe all of the, most of them, if not all of them, are part of the Turtle Bay's district. I, did, I haven't checked all of them, but I believe they are. The brick masonry on the rear facade, have you done any sample removals of the glazed brick? Not yet. Not yet. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. So why don't we turn to public testimony? Oh, Commissioner Goldblum, go ahead. Just thought of it. Um, do we have uh, this? This might be more for Corey. Are there examples of um, similar facade relocations on individual landmarks that, that we might uh, uh, think about as precedents to this? Not that we ever do precedents. <laughs> um, relocation, I'm not sure. I know there, I, I believe there was a project up um, near St. Patrick's, there's an individual landmark, maybe the Pierce building where I think the rear facade was reconstructed in an entirely different way. It kind of didn't have the, um, the burden, if you will, of kind of contributing to a greater context like it would if it were in a historic district. So I think it was found appropriate to do something completely different in that case. I don't know that, it, I don't recall that it had a change in plane, but that's that's the only one that comes to mind you know, from recent past. Thank you. There, am I able okay. to speak now? Um, yes, if you wanted to answer one Sarah, of the questions. Yes, just to answer Hi. the question, uh, we did a restoration of to Northmore in Tribeca. Uh, there was a corner building that was in the historic district and we added a taller six story building. And in that case, we reconstructed the whole facade brick by brick. We drew out every single brick and we had it reconstructed with the same brick back again because the whole facade was falling apart. So it doesn't count as relocating a facade but we definitely have the experience of rebuilding facades exactly as they were. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, w was the uh, was the North Moore building a, uh, a 20th century building or a 19th and 18th century building? I believe it was a 19th century building. So it had lime mortar yeah. rather than uh, Portland cement mortar. I believe so. I don't remember the particulars, but I think you're right.
Okay. Other questions? Okay. And I think, you know, we may have some questions after we listen to public testimony, but why don't we do that now? So I'm going to turn to our Director of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, uh, Anthony Fabre, to walk us through the testimony. And if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you, your virtual hand. And we will begin with anyone who signed up in advance, as we always do. All right, Anthony? Yes, so we do have uh, Kelly Carroll, who I will bring in. So Kelly, you should be um, in, so you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Are you there? I am here, thank you. We can hear you and see you. Perfect, thank you so much. Kelly Carroll for Historic Districts Council. The Lascaz House requires no introduction to the Landmarks Commission. It holds the superlative of being the first modern style residence in New York City and the first employment of structural glass block and glass brick were so novel that the building's department took months to approve their utilization. Every aspect of this building was a deliberate design move by the architect, from where and how the sun would enter a room, to the separation and connections of living and working, to curating views to the outside. This is not a typical application for a rear yard extension of a row house, and the designation report describes the totality of the building's design importance as, quote, it is a classic, a prototypical building which, having survived over 40 years in a world of vertiginous change, still retains its validity, aesthetically, urbanistically, structurally, and humanistically, end quote. In the drawing set, the page labeled LPC09.A illustrates what this project proposes to do. Demolish nearly all of its historic fabric, save for the street facade, in order to extend the rear facade a mere six feet. HDC is not convinced that the proposed reconstruction is appropriate. This house must survive intact as it has since 1934. If facsimile is being sought, we encourage the applicant to persuade the owner to build a new Lascaz house on an empty lot to the dimensions of their fancy. Owners of great works acknowledge that they are but temporary stewards of the piece and there is an implied responsibility of not imprinting one's personal marks of vanity on a masterpiece. Thank you. Thank you. So I am going to bring in Mark Bench. Mark, Thank you. Can you, you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, this is Mark Bench on behalf of the uh, Preservation Committee of the Victorian Society Metropolitan Chapter. Chair Carroll, Commissioners, good morning. The late Henry Hope Reed considered buildings like Lascar's House to be direct descendants of the anti-classical, picturesque 19th century Victorian architecture we know and love. The Lascar's House itself falls well outside the remit of the Victorian Society, but we comment on this project because it illustrates a larger historic preservation issue. This issue is clearly illustrated in slide 19, which shows that the proposal will effectively demolish the house behind the street facade. In a city where so many of our designated buildings have uh, only a single visible facade, we shouldn't minimize the real potential for ending up with stage set historic facades rather than real historic buildings. Today's proposal is not the first and it will surely not be the last of this type. The commission designates buildings, not facades. Historic preservation is about preserving buildings, districts and historic fabric, not facadism and the Commission is a historic preservation agency, not an aesthetic review board. There is something wrong when the definition of protected architectural features prevents the Commission from preserving buildings and protecting historic fabric beyond what can be seen from the street and leads the agency to approve facade projects. The SCARS' the goal, as described by the Commission's designation report, and I quote, the creation of architecture expressive of the spirit and life of the 20th century and of each client's individual requirements is fully realized in this house by harmonious design, deceptive simplicity, determined by a rational, 
functional plan and develop through the use of the newest available technology, materials and methods of construction. The La Scars House is recent, relatively speaking. Designated buildings of greater age often have historically interesting and important structural and constructional features, cast iron columns, massive wood beams with hand joinery, brick nogging or cobbing within the wall. These represent significant historic fabric and can be of historic architectural interest. In historic frame buildings, visible exterior fabric has often been replaced, sometimes more than once, and unseen materials may represent the major part of the remaining historic fabric. Yet these are not exterior architectural features and the current definitions leave them unprotected. The Victorian Society suggests, in light of the application currently before the Commission, that it would be useful to begin considering how to modify the definition of protected features to allow the Commission some jurisdiction over the unseen parts of the building's fabric when that fabric is deemed important to the building's history and integrity. This would be different from interior landmark designation, which generally encompasses visible interior features, finishes usually of extraordinary visual quality. Regarding Lascar's house itself, the Commission said it best in its report. The William Lascar's house and office is a fulfillment of his prophecy. It is a classic, a prototypical building, which having survived over 40, now 86 years, in a world of vertiginous change, still retains its validity, aesthetically, urbanistically, structurally. Mark here, well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, we do have one other person that's raised their hand. Um, cannot read their name. Um, I, I believe this is John Arbuckle. John, are you there? John? I don't believe he's there. John, um, you just have to unmute your okay. microphone. We can hear you. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, you can, you can go ahead. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, so good morning, commissioners. I'm John Arbuckle, president of Docomomo US New York Tri-State, a local chapter of an international organization working in over 65 countries around the world. Our mission is to increase public awareness and appreciation of modern architecture, landscapes, and urban design to identify and document local examples and to advocate for the protection of those determined most significant. Since 1996, the chapter has been advancing this mission in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Completed in 1934, the groundbreaking Lascaux House was the first international style residence built in New York City, the first house in the city with central air conditioning, and the first building in New York City to employ structural glass block. It was designed by the architect William Lascaux, a key figure in the introduction of the modern movement in America as his own home and studio. Two years before with George Howe, he had completed the seminal PSFS building in Philadelphia, the first international style skyscraper built in the United States. Lascaux lived and practiced architecture in the house for three and a half decades until his death in 1969. As both an innovative early example of modernism and the longtime home and studio of a leading modern architect, Lascaux House is among the most important works of modern architecture in New York and nationally significant. Almost exactly 45 years ago, on January 27, 1976, the Landmarks Preservation Commission recognized its exceptional significance by making it one of the very first works of modern architecture in the city to be individually designated. We are fortunate that today, while it has suffered from some deferred maintenance, the exterior of the Lascaux House remains largely original, yet now its integrity is threatened. The current application would dramatically change the building's exterior envelope by building a penthouse, extending existing chimneys, completely removing its entire original historic rear facade and attempting to replicate it six feet further north and lowering the rear yard. Docomomo US New York Tri-State strongly opposes these unnecessary alterations to this well-preserved landmark and respectfully requests that the commission reject these aspects of the present application. The current proposal also includes a respectful restoration of the front facade 
including preserving original historic materials where possible and replacing failed glass blocks with new custom fabricated glass blocks to match the existing. We applaud this portion of the application and hope that it will be completed. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't see anyone else for this item. Um, we can move on. Okay, thank you, Anthony. So Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 6 uh, with no objection to the project. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so now I'd like to turn back to the applicants and see if they'd like to respond to the comments. Wayne, Alex, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, sure, I could uh, say something. Um, you know, studying architecture actually Liscaz was one of my favorites. So I don't take this, this renovation lightly. Uh, the fact is, is that it, this has been a building that hasn't been occupied by a residence for a while. And as mentioned before, there's been deferred maintenance. It's always a difficult situation when someone comes along and wants to alter something like this because the house wasn't designed for someone like themselves. So what we tried to do was to take as sensitive approach as we could. We feel confident about the addition on the roof because of the correspondence that we found. It's true he didn't build it, but perhaps he didn't have the money to build it, but he did plan for it. Uh, as far as the rear addition, moving it back, um, we do plan to do that as carefully as possible so that if one looked at the fabric afterwards, it would look pretty much the same. It is true that we are, we are extending it over the skylights on the rear deck, but the building was designed for his studio. And now we have a family that wants to use it for a family and they, they are not architects and they don't have a studio. So we're doing, the bottom line is we've tried to gingerly and uh, selectively approach this project and hope that you give it consideration. Alex, do you have anything? Uh, no, that's, that's good. All right, thank you. We do have another question. Commissioner Chen, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the question has to do with the original intent of, uh, there might be some evidence of they wanting to add the addition on top. From what the, uh, you can gather during the correspondence, what was the extent of the enlargement on top? Uh, what what was what was being proposed on the rooftop? It doesn't the um, the correspondence that we found uh, doesn't get into the details of the extent. It me it mentions a terrace at the front, meaning that the addition wouldn't have extended the front facade, but would have been set back. Um, it also mentions that the addition couldn't have filled the entire roof because they were trying to figure out where mechanical equipment would be located relative to this addition. Um, but it doesn't go into specifics of the, the exact kind of boundaries of it. Um, no indication of use? No indication of use, no. Not that we found. Just a mention of a stair connecting it, a spiral stair connecting it from the top floor up into this addition. We have some suspicion that that might be why there's a round skylight that was framed out, um, just because it, at least to, to us, felt a little bit odd. Um, so perhaps that was the futuring for this uh, stair in addition, but that's just speculation. We haven't found anything that backs that up. Right. I also want to mention that, uh, as Alex mentioned, we, uh, we reached out to the archives at Syracuse University for Liscaz, and we don't intend to stop. There's a lot more material there, uh, but we did find that correspondence, and we hope to find more. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions, commissioners? Any final questions? All right, then I'm starting to request to unmute you and we will make a motion to close the hearing and begin our discussion. 
So, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close the hearing. All right. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And so, we are looking at um, expansion sort of in multiple directions. And so let's try to comment on all aspects of this as well as sort of the overall cumulative effects. We have a rooftop addition, which then extends back on to a new rear extension, which is the full height pushing out and reconstructing the rear wall. And then um, extension work on the rear uh, studio building. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start this one? Sure, thank you. Um, let's see. So I want to underscore Commissioner Devonshire's question. Uh, first question, are other renovations on the block to buildings that are individual landmarks? And so let's remember that this is an individual landmark, which of course we all do, but I want for that to be the kind of the primary uh, understanding. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, my, my connection to my professional sort of connection to Lascaz and to the Lascaz house comes directly through my Im very important teacher, the late Diane Lewis, who, as many of you know, was an interesting character. Um, but um, among other things, I mean, and, and a brilliant, brilliant thinker, um, but among many other things, um, she lived in this house for some time, um, having approached the widow, actually, of Lascaz and asked if there were rooms for rent there. She was actually married in that house too, Diane was. Um, and, and Diane was my teacher in modernism. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not a far um, distance from, you know, how, just, just the connection to Lascaz. But the other important thing that, that attaches it all for me is that uh, Diane said that and felt strongly that um, the Lascaz house was actually the source or among the sources for the principles of John Haydick's wall house. Mm. And, um, and, and that kind of, you know, is, the, is, is, a, is an interesting lineage. Of course, Lascaz's teacher, Carl Moser, was also an important figure for Haydick, but that's, that's kind of a separate point. Um, all this to say that um, that the, I am not surprised that the only sort of clue or reference to a roof element, potential future roof, if there ever was, what is the, is a whole, is a circular hole, because of course the, that kind of modernist idiom would say that there would be only a circular staircase that would puncture that, that top level. Um, but I, I'm, it, it sort of given the kind of the, the, the sensibility that, that um, Lascaz had, the references to Haydock and through Diane Lewis make me think that the roof as it's proposed, firstly, at all, an, a roof addition at all on this building, I have a question about it. I do think that likely he would have done it and he would have done it very differently, Lascaz would, if he had wanted to. I don't know about the finances or anything. But as it's designed right now, I, I'm, I'm absolutely not convinced about it. It doesn't enter into, into a discussion with the kind of that, you know, the, the puncturing of, a, of an object on a roof as a circular staircase, a spiral staircase would have done, or to the Heiduckian, you know, the, the further iteration in the Heiduck's kind of planar and, and kind of wavy planar um, accretions on the building. So I, so in, for many reasons, I'm not convinced of it, nor do I think it should even be considered. And then finally, I would just say, um, I feel the same way about that. It's, it's, it's minimal, but the, the transom line in the back rear uh, window wall seems to be a complete, though seemingly small, but significant departure from the intention. Thank you. Commissioner Halford Smith. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, I view this um, 
in a way that we have viewed similar renovations to, to townhouses um, that are not individual landmarks where we are um, concerned about maintaining the original form of the house. So keeping the top floor of a, of a 19th century townhouse is an important thing that we always consider. Um, and so for me, the actual uh, extending of the entire rear facade um, is something that I can't support. I think that the, the original house needs to be viewed as the original volume that it was. Um, and I understand and really interesting comments that Adi made about the rooftop addition, although I think that I could support a smaller rooftop addition um, given the fact that there is a little bit of documentation supporting it, but not, nothing that, that would be as visible as it's, as it's supposed. Um, and finally, the, the rear yard, I think that I would be okay in dropping the rear yard, um, if that is something that's um, really not visible and seems to me um, a less prominent feature of the house. But I, I can't support the, the, the removal of that rear, rear, rear wall. Okay, thank you. All right, and Commissioner Chapin? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, this is a such a, uh, you know, wonderful uh, example uh, of the architect's work and the importance of this particular individual landmark in uh, architectural history in New York City. I also cannot I really can't support the extension of the wall in the back. And I know it's gonna be reconstructed, hopefully, to, to look like what it currently looks like, to removing a lot of historic fabric and changing uh, the volumes. And I just don't think it's appropriate in this, this instance. I also think a rooftop addition could be appropriate. I think that probably this needs to be reduced somewhat uh, and I won't comment on the, at, at the moment on the, uh, you know, as far as the design, it's, it's fairly simple and from my perspective, but uh, I just say that I think a rooftop addition could be appropriate. Uh, I think that some of the changes like the north rear facade, uh, the excavation, the enlargement of the basement windows, and the skylights on the upper and lower terraces, I think, I think those things could be done without fundamentally affecting one's perception of, of this individual landmark. Uh, so I, I, that's, I think those comments are you know, adequate for the time being. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, I, um, you know, this is, this is, this is, there, there, are land, there are individual landmarks and then there are individual landmarks. And this is a remarkable one uh, because it's so different from um, many of the other buildings that we protect. In terms of townhouses, I think it's, 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 it's most important difference is that the back is not envisioned as a back. The back is envisioned as a designed facade, and more than that, it's, it's envisioned as a designed three-dimensional indoor-outdoor space. <clears throat> and the sequence of spaces from the um, uh, first floor out onto the patio, up onto the upper level, that, and then looking back on the facade, <clears throat> that whole sequence of spaces, their proportions, their um, finishes, are all part of what he definitely considered to be a, a, a synthesized single architectural endeavor. Um, and I would therefore find the moving of the facade, even if it, it, it's doable with all of the existing bricks, <clears throat> to be a, an incursion on those proportions, which I think were very much uh, intended by the architect. Clearly, he didn't have problems extending the building if he wanted to. He chose not to in the back because the sequence of indoor-outdoor spaces, which was a very important thing to modernism at that time, was something he was trying to express here uh, with the whole the whole patio sequence. <laughs> so I think that that 
uh, constricting that as well as modifying the, the volume of the building is, is a, uh, an inappropriate thing. <clears throat> I agree with others who said that the rooftop addition could be acceptable, but I think that the applicant would really try to and and kind of playing down the architectural incursion to have it engage in a dialogue, as I think Adi had said, with the architecture. <clears throat> and that can be one where you seek to explore the language of the architecture or where you seek to juxtapose it. But I think that in either case, um, seeking to minimize it, given its visibility, especially from the West, is a non-starter. You're going to see this thing. So it should be something, I think, I think it's okay. And I think certainly the spirit of Lascaz would accept an addition on the roof um, that talked with his architecture, just like his architecture talked with its neighbors um, in, an, you know, in, a, in an overtly aggressive, uh, look at me, I'm, this is the contemporary expression way. Um, and I think that that would be appropriate for a rooftop addition. Um, but it, it, given the fact that the back facade, in my opinion, shouldn't move, it would mean that that would have to be reduced in size. And I think that the uh, modifications to the very furthest, um, I guess, uh, the, the lowered rear yard uh, at the very back is, is acceptable because it was not a, uh, deemed a, a significant facade by the architect. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devinger. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, I guess just briefly, um, I'm in agreement with my colleagues about there being an addition on the roof. I want it to be virtually invisible from the public right of way. It's got to be reduced incredibly. I am okay with the restorative work on the on the front facade. I actually looked at this building 30 years ago for Jan, who had been uh, contracted with the then owner and the fact that they would have to have custom made glass block is what scared them away from uh, purchasing this building, which is interesting. We've, we've come a long way. Um, again, like Michael with the, the subtle changes with regard to skylights and things on the terrace at the rear, um, I'm okay with that. I am not okay either conceptually with extending the, the rear facade, nor uh, forensically. The, the glazed brick can, it will only be able to be removed with grinders. Portland cement mortar is extremely hard. If they were to be able to get the bricks out without damaging them, removing the Portland cement mortar from each of the bricks will, can only be done with a grinder. A grinder will destroy the glazing on every arras of every brick. And so it will be a complete reconstruction with new brick and, and discarding of all of that historic fabric. I, I say that with utmost certainty about the <coughs> of the bricks and reuse them. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the majority of the comments. I think this is such a wonderful, iconic building. And I think the, uh, just with uh, Commissioner Goldblum and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Diana Chapin and, uh, and Adi, that the, uh, I think the, re, uh, and Commissioner Devonshire's comment just now about the rear facade should stay where it is. Uh, I do uh, support the idea of uh, some reduce and modify uh, at uh, the, uh, the penthouse addition, given that there's some evidence there, uh, but I agree with the majority of the comments. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland. Um, thank you. Um, I want to, first of all, um, um, commend the, uh, um, the testimony that we had. I thought it was particularly erudite and persuasive. Uh, secondly, I want to commend the presenter, who I thought did a wonderful, very clear, no-nonsense uh, job of presenting what I think is a difficult, <laughs> 
difficult uh, presentation to make to us, um, but nonetheless, I appreciated the clarity of it. Um, I also want to note that here we are obsessing, as we should be, over a building that we would never, ever approve today. You know, breaking a a, a row of uh, uh, you know uh, of, of townhouses. Uh, and there are several others in the Upper East Side, uh, Edward Rail Stones, uh, unbelievable uh, change. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful irony and we'll never resolve the irony. Uh, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't allow these sorts of incursions most likely, but here we have one and what a wonderful anomaly it is. So uh, with all of that, uh, I'm gonna line up, I think pretty clear, clearly with uh, others. Most objective, most, uh, my most uh, ob 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 objection to all of this though is the move back of the rear facade by six feet. I think that's just a non-starter. We can't, we just can't allow that to happen. I don't need to state all the reasons have been beautifully stated, but I didn't even need to hear, but thank goodness, uh, Commissioner Devonshire's uh, forensic addition really uh, sunk it. For me, that was, that was uh, I mean, it, on conceptual level, it shouldn't be done, but then on a forensic level, to hear that uh, was more persuasive. Um, I too could support an, an addition, not this one, because uh, it, it should be smaller. I don't mind seeing a little bit of it in the front actually, uh, but others did. So we'll have to just wait and see how that works out. But the other, um, the other, um, the other additions, the rear rear yard, uh, certainly that, uh, is, is acceptable to me. And the other, what I call minor uh, additions to the uh, glazed uh, brick on this and the uh, terraces and so forth, that, that's, that's all to the good. But the basic uh, huge issue of changing this individual landmark uh, by making it a, 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 you know, a Disneyland version of what was there, allowing the original material to be removed is, is wrong. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, so I, I also wanna thank everybody for all of their testimony and input. And I do agree that the, uh, the applicants, uh, the applicants architects have a, have a very challenging project here. I also want to echo a lot of the sentiments of, of my colleagues. This is like one of the buildings, you know, this is such a special, uh, you know, modernism gem. It's, it's the kind of building when you walk down the street and you see it, you just get incredibly excited about it. It just hits you and you're so happy it's there and it's wonderful that it already is a landmark and we need to do everything we can to preserve that. I, I happen to agree pretty much all around that the front, thank you, Mike, Michael Devonshire, has to uh, be maintained and the glass and the uh, glass should be maintained to, you know, to the best of, uh, are the applicant's ability. I don't think there should be an extension on the rear. I don't have a problem with the lowering of the building. I do think um, it's okay to have an addition on the top, but it shouldn't be visible. Uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I, I think I spent the weekend thinking about this project. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I had to rethink what I thought a landmark is and um, a, 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 how much fabric you could add, how much fabric you could remove and it still remain a landmark. And I had to think about that. And uh, I think I've become very conservative on this. Uh, I think that a landmark, all its flaws, all its spaces that are not recognizable today as, as, as functional should remain. So for example, the back, I mean, those are very small, tiny spaces, but they were part of this landmark, you know, and, 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 and in the future, if my 
kid wanted to go look at this building and said, this is a landmark building done in 1930-something. And it's not there anymore. They changed it because of some reason. So uh, I want to keep everything pretty much the same. I think the addition on the top, it would have to be so small for me to accept it that it, it, it's just too large now. Visible on the diagonal, it's just impossible and moving the wall moving the wall building six feet i mean that's incredible to me i couldn't believe it so my position is um uh, the black windows don't work i mean keep it as close to the original as possible okay all right thank you and commissioner gustafson um i I, I don't have a lot to add. I'll try to be brief. Again, the issue of it being an individual landmark um, and not merely a building in an historic district changes everything. Um, it is more important than that. Um, it is a one of a kind uh, structure. Um, that means that most of it is carefully designed. Um, it's not a, re a random rear facade. It's carefully designed. Um, rooftop um, it's a small building. All individual landmarks are not created equal. Sometimes we allow more on top of buildings than others. This is a small building. Anything that's highly visible um, is unacceptable to me. It can be slightly visible. I, I wouldn't be concerned about that, but I'm talking about slightly. Um, in the end, I think one of the people who testified uh, focused on an issue that I ra I've raised repeatedly, and that is um, facadism, which is to say uh, we, you're, they were right. We designate buildings. We don't designate facades. If the law wanted us to designate facades, that's what we would do. Um, so um, with that said, I also um, uh, do not support the, um, the movement of the, uh, of, of the rear facade. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and I think for several reasons, including those set forth by uh, Commissioner Devonshire. Okay, thank you. Thank you all commissioners. And I also wanna thank John. I think the presentation was very clear and helpful to understand. And I think the testimony was very helpful. And commissioners, as always, your comments are thoughtful and you carefully consider all that you've heard and seen. And, um, and I think we've had a very good discussion today. So where we are is, I, you know, I think that there is no support for relocating the rear facade. Um, there is some support for a smaller and perhaps redesigned rooftop addition that relates to the architecture in some way. And I think that some of the other changes to the rear, um, to less significant portions of the rear may be deemed appropriate, but we'll take no action today and we'll let the applicants um, absorb the comments and think about um, revisions that would involve keeping the rear facade in its original plane and um, working from there. So um, we'll take no action and we'll see the applicants back when they're ready. And we will now move to the next item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. We're gonna, yep. we're gonna move to public meeting item number three, LPC 20-09990, an application for an amendment. This is in the borough of Brooklyn, block 208. Lot 101, 124 Columbia Heights in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. A neo-federal style building built circa 1930, a modern style building built in 1949, and a remnant of a late 19th, early 20th century building. The application is to amend Certificate of Appropriateness 19-2962 to raise parapets and install railings. Uh, and the staff will do a brief introduction to, to lead us off. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Caroline Passion, Preservation Staff. The application before you today is to amend and expand the scope of work that was presented and approved at the public hearing and public meeting of August 8, 2017. At that time, the commissioners approved the installation of rooftop additions, which included a bulkhead, canopy, mechanical equipment, and metal railings, a one-story addition at the rear of the building, as well as modifying openings, installing windows, doors, and creating a curb cut. So the applicant has returned to amend the certificate of appropriateness um, to raise the 
parapets at the secondary rear and side elevations uh, to install and to install black metal railings. And the architect, uh, Thomas Hutt, is here to discuss this proposal and walk you through the visibility sight lines. Okay, thank you. And we'll need to open the hearing for that. So commissioners, I'm requesting to unmute you um, right now. And commissioner um, Chen, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. It's the proceeding. It's the proceeding. Proceeding. Oh, yeah. sorry. I thought this was a... I'm sorry. You're right, ready. Sarah. I'll take it back. No, it's an amendment. It's a public meeting. It's a proceeding. Right? Not read into the record. Correct. 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 So it's a motion. So I'll make the motion to open the proceedings. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? We'd like that to second it. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The proceedings are open and the applicant may speak. Is the applicant here? Uh, yes, he's here. I don't. If the applicant can please unmute yourself. Unmuted. Can you Unmuted. hear me? Good. Yeah. yeah. Please Terrific. state your name for the record. Yeah. My name is Thomas Hutt. I'm the owner of HS2 Architecture. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair Carroll and commissioners. Uh, we're back here before you to uh, request permission to raise the parapet in the southwest portion uh, of the project to accommodate a rooftop uh, soaking pool. Um, Carol, Caroline, would you like to start at the beginning or should I start on zero four? Uh, I'll, I'll go to the beginning. Okay, I'll, I'll run briefly through just so to orientate everyone. Okay. Uh, as, she, as Caroline mentioned, <clears throat> this is a, a drawing from the previous application and we've just supplemented it with uh, a number 15, which is sort of highlighted in yellow, which shows the location of the soaking pool in the Southwest corner on the upper roof. Um, and that, that's, the, uh, that's among all the other uh, appurtenances that were approved previously in 2017. Next slide. Uh, a rooftop, this is just a roof plan view of the location of that pool. And what's rendered in brown there is the uh, extent of the scope of the raised parapet, which we are presenting here today. That's just a closer view. Uh, you'll see that it's a raised deck. We're trying to place the pool above uh, the roof so that we don't in any way um, invalidate the apartments be below. Uh, we have steps up to it and a small uh, accessible lift. Uh, and again, what's rendered in brown is the area of the raised masonry parapet to accommodate the height of the deck and then a metal railing that will accompany that. Here's from the uh, proposed west facade. Uh, it's a portion of it. Uh, it wouldn't fit on the entire drawing because we wanted to also include the previous uh, application approval. And you'll see that the railings are consistent all the way in the only change to the top level here is that we are uh, adding that additional masonry, uh, a small enclosure for the accessible lift, and then the metal railing on top of that additional masonry that's rendered in brown. View from the south, pretty much uh, indicating the same thing. The previous application approval on the left, uh, it just shows that the railings are consistently the same. And then just at the top here, we've raised the portion uh, of that section of the roof. A view here, again, a plan with some, some quick sections through the pool. Uh, it was, its intent is to be towards the west to be sort of an infinity edge, uh, but we're raising the parapet at that as well. Uh, and that's just the extent of the uh, raised area. Just a brief, quick renderings of it. These are uh, just quick views uh, showing the general look of what we're, we're planning on. A mock-up we prepared for staff. Uh, you'll see here that uh, the original roof there, uh, the masonry buildup is sort of rendered in orange, the horizontal level from the deck itself. It's about three foot two and a half. And then there'll be a 42 inch metal railing on top of that for a code compliant railing. 
This is a view from actually from the north, uh, it's the northwest corner. You'll see here that once we build on top of the existing parapet, we're actually only adding two foot two and one eighth inches of masonry, uh, and then the 42 inch uh, code complying railing. So where the masonry stops is obvious, is the deck of the pool itself. Um, and then we're adding railing on top of that. We just prepared a few views from below uh, where it's really the only visible uh, views. This is from the park below, uh, just west of the Esplanade. Uh, this is from the Northwest. You'll see at the upper area, uh, there's the railings that are called out and the small areas, the bands of, of masonry addition. This is a little further west uh, uh, on one of the uh, piers uh, and the new, and the, uh, New Marina there. From this, this is from the southwest, uh, just below it. Uh, you can see that uh, the extent of the, the, the metal railing there, and then between the two cast stone bands, that's the extent of the additional masonry uh, with the new stone coping on top of it. And a little further away, just to show as much as we could. That's, that's actually all, all that we have to present. Um, uh, open to any questions or clarifications. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Goldblum? Uh, two questions for you. First of all, you, you had just said that there was an existing precast band and a new one? Yes, yes. So you're leaving the old one and then put it, so it'll be like a double stripe at the top? Yes, uh, staff <laughs> have suggested that as to maintain that previous datum. Uh, we can go either way if, if you felt that you wanted it to run consecutive. I mean, we, we are matching the brick very closely, uh, but it also might serve as a, a demarcation of the new brick area. And um, the um, bulkhead, the uh, lift, not visible from anywhere in the public way? No, it's not. It's only visible from, uh, uh, barely visible from the furthest west that you can get, but not from anywhere on the street nor close along the Esplanade. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Commissioner Jefferson? Just unmute yourself. Oh, okay. oh, thanks, 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 Al. Um, uh, I have two questions. One on LTC zero one. If you could go to that sheet. Uh, the uh, no, your cover sheet, your cover sheet, LPC. You have a cover sheet that had a, an, okay, this one. You see on the right hand side is, is the detail, the roof coping. Is that the similar detail that you're doing on the, on the roof for the side? You see how you have the coping stone and then you have a band of brick and then you have another coping stone. Uh. Well, we, I didn't necessarily intend to emulate that per se. We were just using the, uh, maintaining the existing stone coping, building on top of that with new brick and then uh, replicating that stone, stone coping higher up with the new coping at the top of the parapet. So when, when I was looking at the drawings, I thought, gee, they did that. So that's why they did it on the other side. And if you go back, if you go back to, um, uh, LPC 11. I thought, you see where the, your stone, your brick ends. And I thought, gee, would it be nice to take the, the brick addition all the way to where the volumetric change happens. So you could have a consistent, um, detail. It's just a suggestion. Uh, we're so you, you we're, op we're open to, we're we're open to either to either to maintain the original uh, coping there or to remove it. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? 
Okay, so this is a public meeting item. So there is no testimony, but we, as always, welcome any written comments. So I'll turn to Rich and see if we've received any written comments on these changes. We do not have any. Okay, thank you. All right. So if there are no final questions, I think we can move to our discussion. So commissioners, I am starting to request to unmute all of you so we can do that. Um, and this is Caroline presented in the, or introduced the project. She noted that this is an amendment to a certificate of appropriateness that approved a lot of work, including rooftop and rear additions, modifying masonry openings, and installing rooftop mechanical equipment and um, railings at the various setbacks. And so this proposal increases the scope of work to include addition, raising the parapets and additional railings. Um, and as presented, been presented, the lift is um, not visible from a public way. So uh, let's start our discussion on this. And uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this one? Oh, sure. you know what? I've, I, I had you already read one. Let me start somewhere else to give you a break. Commissioner Gustafson, would you start? Um, yeah, sure. This this is this is going to be brief. I think that uh, um, uh, blend in uh, quite well. Um, I don't really uh, with the distance that you're looking at all of it. It, it just uh, um, it, it really isn't terribly visible, and in some directions, it's not visible at all. Um, so I, I am fine with this. I think it's appropriate as is. Great, thank you, and. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm in agreement with that. It seems, I mean, I, I um, understand Commissioner Jefferson's the questions and, and um, suggestions, um, and I kind of uh, in, in agreement, but I think that this is appropriate as it's been presented. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, yes, I agree that this is appropriate. I think that keeping the original coping and Adding the brick and a new coping on top will it will help sort of not have that that visible seam between two different you know colors of brick because they won't match perfectly. So I think that keeping the original coping is actually a good idea. So I'm, I'm okay with it as is. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I, I think I, I can support uh, this proposal. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I'm not a. I, I think that the the double the double pr uh, coping is going to attract attention to it. I would suggest they take it out. Uh, I, I hear Anne's reasoning, and I, I'm sure that she's right. <clears throat> but um, I think that at that distance, I'd rather see a, a slight variation of a type that we see on buildings all over New York City than a kind of racing stripe uh, that's kind of saying, "Look at me." Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's appropriate, Sarah. Okay, as is. Yep. Okay, C Commissioner Chen. Uh, I agree with the uh, comments uh, and uh, especially uh, Harold Smith's comment. Okay, so keeping it as is. Okay, um, Commissioner Bland. Yeah, we're looking at a view that I get to see almost every morning that I'm in Brooklyn Heights, which unfortunately isn't as often as I would like it to be these days. But nonetheless, uh, I've been uh, looking at this building for you know 50 years, but uh, really looking at it uh, as it's undergoing its current renovation and uh, very happy for it. Yeah, I can support it as is. I understand the double versus the single um, parapet uh, or, or coping issue, but I, I don't think either way is gonna make or break this. Mostly what I'm happy to see is people using their roofs uh, for things that are uh, like recreation and outdoor use. Uh, hopefully we don't ever have another pandemic where we need outdoor use so desperately as we do now, but nonetheless, uh, use of roofs is such an, such an underdeveloped idea still in New York and uh, it's slowly but surely catching on. So I'm... Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Oops, Commissioner Lutfi. All right, I think she's not with us at the moment. So, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, um, this is this is this building has such a volumetric rooftop that it's 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 quite wonderful. 
I I would just suggest one thing that you extend the power to 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 meet the um, the other volume on the right hand side. I think it, it's acceptable. I think it's a good solution. Okay. Okay. So I do think that. Um, I know, uh, uh, Commissioner Goldblum, you felt it would be better without keeping the parapet and having a change in the brick color, but I do think most everyone else is supportive of it as is. So we'll go ahead and make the motion that way. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you go ahead and make that motion? Uh, in the matter of LPC 20-099991124 Columbia Heights in, in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, the application is to amend Certificate of Appropriateness 19-20962 to raise parapets and install railings. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not damage or destroy any significant architectural features of the parapet or the building, that the parapets and railings will be constructed on top of the existing brick parapets and stone coping, and therefore historic fabric will be retained, that raising the parapets and installing railings will be limited to the secondary rear, west, north, and south facades, that the work will not be visible over the primary facade, that the proposed raised parapets and metal railings will be seen in context with the existing and commission approved rooftop accretions and will blend with the stepped massing and varying planes of the buildings when viewed from a distance along the promenade piers and park. That the design and materials of the raised parapets consisting of brick and stone coping will match the existing brick and stone coping at the building and that the proposed simply designed black metal railings at the raised parapets will match the commission approved metal railings. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Yes, I'll second it. Okay. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lefty? No, she's Lefty? not present. She's, she's not, not present. present. Okay. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and one not present, the motion carries. Okay, so that's approved. And thank that you. concludes the, thank you very much. That concludes the public meeting portion of our agenda and our morning session. And so we will now break for 30 minutes for lunch and we will turn at one o'clock. Um, commissioners, just turn your audio and video off and all members of the public, if you're in the meeting, you should leave the meeting now and rejoin the meeting at one o'clock. Thank you all. Okay, so I'm gonna pause recording.